I call this meeting of the Appropriations Committee to order. Thank you. I'd like to welcome all members to the first full committee markups of fiscal year 2023. And it's wonderful to be here, mostly all of us in, in, in person. Uh, this morning, it is going to be a, um, a, what is it that Betty Davis said in All About Eve? You know, fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy ride. So we have, you know, the next uh, uh, several weeks to, uh, we're going to finish our subcommittee, full committee markups uh, uh, by the end of June, and then the, the bill's on the floor in July. Uh, before we begin, I have a number of housekeeping announcements. Uh, this information was previously conveyed to your staff, but I want to reiterate that no food will be allowed in the room per the Ways and Means Committee, and they might have the Ways and Means Committee police looking at us here to see if we're doing that. But drinks are fine if you have a lid, okay? So, and please throw away your own trash. Um, uh, we have arranged to have lunch at courtesy of Congressman Cuellar, so it will be Texas barbecue today. And it will be in the Minority Conference Room in Longworth 1036. That's directly below the hearing room. And a thank you to Ranking Member Granger for providing the space. Thanks very, very much, Kate. Um, for those of you who are joining remotely, uh, please be respectful of those in the hearing room and do not talk over them uh, when they have been recognized. Um, let me just start by, again, welcoming uh, everyone to the first full Appropriations Committee as we mark up uh, the fiscal year 2023. This is the busiest time of the year for our committee. We have already hit the ground running. We have completed eight subcommittee markups, and there are two more scheduled for after today's full committee markup concludes. Um, uh, and, and we will, uh, as I said, finish all of the full uh, sub and full committee meetings by the end of next week. To start, let me just say a very uh, a warm thank you to Ranking Member Granger for her partnership, for her commitment to the work of this committee, uh, and uh, the, 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 the time and effort that she puts into making the appropriations process uh, one that works, uh, not only to the benefit of both sides of the aisle, uh, but to the people that we uh, represent in this in this body. So thank you very very much Kay, for your for your help. Um, I also want to welcome a new member on the Republican side, but Ranking Member Granger is going to introduce her. But I have met uh, Congressman Letlow, and an outstanding addition to the Appropriations Committee. She shares, we met, we, she shares my love of education, but I don't want you to hold that against her, so, okay. Uh, but uh, welcome. Uh, let me also say a thank you to our subcommittee chairs and our ranking members for the hard work and really shifting immediately from finishing the 2022 bill into holding, this is extraordinary, 94 hearings, 94 hearings conducted by the Appropriations Committee, and then moving to write the bills so we could mark up this month. You and your staff have done such an incredible job in such a short period of time, and we're all grateful. You know, th th this is now my second time leading this process. Uh, last year at this time, I reiterated the great responsibility we hold uh, to the generations of appropriation appropriators before us to exercise Congress's power of the purse. And at that time, I paid tribute to the many Democratic and Republican chairs of this committee who came before me, who with trust from the people that they serve, championed the programs and the policies that have shaped our nation and the world for over 150 years. We too held up our responsibility and I'm proud of what we have achieved. Through fiscal year 2022, federal, the federal spending package, we secured transformational investments that help fight inflation, lower the cost of living, create jobs, and support working families. And now, as we continue this work this year, I'm so proud of all that we have done to carefully develop legislation that provides tailored and targeted support for those who need federal investments the most. 
instead of catering to big corporations and billionaires who, despite record profits, continue to raise their prices, we are introducing bills that help the middle class, working families, small businesses, and the vulnerable who work hard every day. We are building safer communities with less crime and violence. And in this time of great uncertainty and change, we are tackling some of our nation's toughest challenges as we strengthen our national and border security, make health care more affordable, and confront climate change on several fronts. And we are growing and strengthening the community project funding that was so successful last year with investments that support underserved areas, foster economic development, make a real difference in the lives of so many of our communities all over the country. There will inevitably be disagreement in certain areas, and we should be ready and willing to debate them. But I want us to never forget the reason that we are all here. And I hope that as we debate the bills, we approach this process knowing that it can and it will help people in long-lasting ways. And now what I would like to do is to recognize Ranking Member Granger for any opening remarks that she may have. Ranking Member Granger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to congratulate you and all of our subcommittee chairs and ranking members for getting to this point, uh, especially uh, as it has only been a few short months since we finished FY22 bills. Uh, we have done an incredible amount of work in a short period of time. It's a testament to each of you and all of our staff who have worked tirelessly to draft the bills we will consider in the coming weeks. While there is still much to be done, I know we will work hard to find common ground over the months ahead. I also want to welcome our new committee member, Congresswoman Julia Letlow of Louisiana. This is the best committee in Congress, and I'm honored to work with you. I also want to recognize and thank Congressman Tom Cole for his continued service as our vice ranking member. Madam Chair, I look forward to a successful markup season as we are all eager to get to work. I thank you and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, welcome to our new member. And I should also mention our vice chair, and that's Brenda Lawrence. Thank you very, very much, Congresswoman Lawrence, for all your efforts. That's to you as well as Congressman Cole. Uh, now it's time to proceed with the business portion of our meeting, where I'll begin with a brief explanation of how the markup will work for those who are joining us virtually. Um, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the main screen. Speaking into the microphone activates the camera, displaying the speaker on the main screen. Do not stop your remarks if you do not immediately see the screen switch. If the screen does not change after several seconds, please make sure you are not muted. To minimize background noise and ensure the correct speaker is being displayed, we ask that you remain on mute unless you have sought recognition. The chair or an individual designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. If, during one of our meetings, we need to move things along and we decide to enforce the five-minute rule, you will notice a clock at the bottom of your screen that will show how much time is remaining. When your time is up, the clock will turn red, and I may gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is expired before recognizing another member. Finally, we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups, including amendments, motions, and other unanimous consent requests. That email address has been provided to your staff. I would remind all members that they must verbally request unanimous consent separately from sending the document or written UC request to the email address. Bear with me for one. the order of business until I can call on members for any of their comments. Our first order of business is to consider the sub-allocation 
of budget allocations for fiscal year 2023, also known as the 302 Bs. The top line funding allocated this year is $1.6 trillion, which is consistent with the deeming resolution adopted by the House this month and with President Biden's budget request. These suballocations reflect our commitment to a framework for the upcoming fiscal year with three critically distinct components. First is the funding to better meet the developing health care needs of our veterans uh, so that, that they so desperately need and have earned. Second, investments in non-defense discretionary programs that build on last year's successes and continue to make up for the shortfalls under the years of statutory caps. And third, responsible investments in defense spending to continue to improve the working and living conditions of our military to address important defense-related environmental concerns and to improve our national security. The investments we are making in the American people are needed to meet the moment. This funding will help people in profound and enduring ways and will help us build a nation and a world where every person, regardless of background, can succeed and flourish. I urge your support for these subcommittee allocations, and I would now like to recognize Ranking Member Granger for any comments. Madam Chair, thank you for yielding. As we sit here today, inflation is 8.6% above last year, the highest it's been in more than 40 years. Economists are saying American households should budget an extra $5,000 this year to cover rising prices. That's over $400 a month. Many families simply can't afford this. Prices of everyday goods have skyrocketed over the last year under the Biden administration. For example, at more than $5 a gallon, gas prices are now the highest they have ever been. Energy services like electricity and natural gas are up 16%. Groceries have increased nearly 12%, the biggest jump since 1979. The cost of new and used cars is up 12%. Rent is rapidly increasing, and airfare has ceased more than, increased more than 37 percent, the largest increase since 1980. Americans are paying more for just about everything. It's clear the large spending packages pushed through Congress by the President and members of the other side of the aisle have been a key driver of inflation. Simply put, record high spending equals record high prices. As appropriators, we have the responsibility to exercise oversight and fiscal restraint. Instead of stopping the out-of-control spending we've seen over the last year, these bills are written to an unprecedented level. That's why no Republican supported the majority's resolution setting the appropriations top-line spending level. The allocations by subcommittee are also a problem. They shortchange defense and overfund social programs. More spending on the same social programs that received trillions of dollars over the last year will only make matters worse. At a time when Americans are struggling to pay for gas, housing, and groceries, we should not be adding to our nation's debt and expanding the size and scope of the federal government. We must cut spending where we can and focus resources on our core federal responsibilities, such as national security. As expected, these allocations do not adequately fund our military, with increasing threats from China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea underfunding our national defense is completely misguided. In closing, I hope we can find common ground over the months ahead We'll need to restore important language from prior bills, agree to remove controversial policy riders, and set responsible funding levels so that bills can get to the president's desk and signed into law. I urge a no vote and yield back my time. Does any other member wish to speak on the allocations? Ms. McCollum?
Try the one on the side. Technical problem solved. Um, I rise in strong support of the 302B allocations, particularly for the uh, defense subcommittee. In FY22, activities funded in the defense uh, subcommittee received a $33 billion increase over FY21. In the bill we consider today, we are providing an additional $33 billion over FY22. And that does not include the more than $26 billion provided to the department in the two Ukrainian supplementals. If you go back to 2015, when we were still fighting in Afghanistan, the Department of Defense received $560 billion. Compared to what is in the House FYI 23 bill in eight years, in eight years we had added more than $200 million to the Department of Defense and spending. Our national security is dependent upon a strong defense, but it is also dependent upon great diplomacy and development. Shortchanging the State Department or USA is a costly mistake to our national security. So please, I encourage members to vote yes on the 32A, excuse me, the 32B allocations. Does any other member wish to speak on the allocations? Are there any amendments to the report? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we, we just heard reference to the uh, uh, unfortunate inflation that's happening in the United States right now, and uh, we shouldn't let such comments pass without noting that in uh, Q1 of 2022, the four biggest oil and gas comp companies made $27 billion in profits. Uh, national inflation is at 8.6 percent, but energy inflation in this country is 32 percent. So there's no question that oil and gas corporation price gouging is driving up prices for everyone and everything. And unfortunately, every Republican voted against the bill in the House to stop oil and gas price gouging. I just wanted to set the record straight, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and if I could, I might add, I think that we are looking at the four major uh, oil companies who have pledged up to $10 billion in stock buybacks in 2022. Uh, BP has announced $4.1 billion in buybacks. Shell has announced $8.5 billion worth of buybacks. Um, and the uh, oil companies are taking care of, of their investors by paying more dividends and committing to share buybacks. And Americans, Americans are paying a price at the pump. Are there any amendments to the report? If no, then uh, let me recognize uh, the a, a gentlelady from Ohio. Madam Chair, I move that the committee approve the report on the 302B allocations for fiscal year 2023. Without a, the clerk will read the amendment. No amendment without objection. Uh, we dispense. Let's move forward. Um, let me get, get to Ms. Capter here. Okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. If there are no further amendments or any amendments, I, I recognize um, uh, Ms. Capter for a motion, which she has made, and the question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. In the opinion of the chair? The ayes have it. Okay. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. I think, okay. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt votes no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes aye. Mr. Amaday. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mrs. Bustos. Aye. Mrs. Bustos votes aye. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert votes no. Mr. Carter. 
No. Mr. Carter votes no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright votes aye. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Klein. No. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Christ. <coughs> Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Ms. Deloro. Aye. Ms. Deloro votes aye. Mr. Diaz Bellart. No. Mr. Diaz Bellart votes no. Mr. Espayat. Aye. Mr. Espayat votes aye. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman votes no. Ms. Frankel. Aye. Ms. Frankel votes aye. Mr. Garcia. No. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes no. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder votes aye. Dr. Harris. Mm -hmm. Dr. Harris votes no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes no. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes no. Ms. Captor. Aye. Ms. Captor votes aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick aye. votes. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence votes aye. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes aye. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes no. Ms. McCollum. Aye. Ms. McCollum votes aye. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng votes aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes no. Mr. Palazzo. No. Mr. Palazzo votes no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree votes aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes no. Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers votes no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Mr. Rutherford. No. Mr. Rutherford votes no. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan votes aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes no. Mrs. Torres. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes aye. Ms. Underwood. Aye. Ms. Underwood votes aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes no. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Clerk will tally. Mrs. Torres? Mrs. Torres votes aye. Mr. Amaday? Mr. Amaday votes no. On this vote, the ayes are 31, the nays are 26. Uh, the report is approved. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the report just approved. Seeing no objection, so ordered. Our next order of business today is consideration of the Yes. I asked for a three days. Oh, I asked sorry. for three days for the minority to file views. Without objection. Yes, thank you. Our next order of business today is consideration of the defense appropriations bill for fiscal year 2023. I will now recognize Ms. McCullum to present the bill. Thank you, Chair Deloro. 
It's an honor to present a fiscal year 2023 defense appropriations bills. I'd like to thank our subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Calvert, for his collaboration and his input, as well as Chair DeLauro and ranking member Granger. And all the subcommittee members for your contributions and participations in the 18 hearings we held this cycle so far today. This bill totals $762 billion, which is $33 billion above the 2022 enacted level, roughly equal to the President's request. I suspect many of my friends on the other side of the aisle, as we've heard already, will say this allocation is insufficient. I respectfully disagree. In March, we passed an ominous omnibus bill, which increased defense spending under the jurisdiction of our subcommittee by nearly $33 billion. That does not include the more than $26 billion we have provided in emergency funds related to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine through two supplementals. This bill adds another $33 billion to the Pentagon's side of the ledger. The situation in Ukraine and the reaction of the democracies across the world should be instructive as we determine an appropriate level of defense spending. As laid out in our new national defense strategy, our security is determined not only by our military might, but our, by our diplomacy and our development efforts. Overfunding the Pentagon while underfunding the State Department, USAID, and investments at home that strengthen our economy is a costly mistake. But what we choose to spend our defense dollars on is also incredibly important. We must modernize our force to compete with our peer adversaries, but the latest weapon systems and platforms are only effective if they can be used appropriately and if they can be maintained appropriately and in the long term. Russia's poor military performance the early spring in Ukraine has highlighted the importance of properly sustaining, equipping, and training the force that you already have. It does us no good to invest in high-tech weapons if we not, cannot overcome the basics and logistic challenges, like getting the right equipment to our troops when they're needed. It makes no difference how many ships we order for the Navy if we cannot maintain them in our existing shipyards. This bill was written to strengthen our existing force, our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our Marines and guardians, to give them the tools that they need to do their job safely and to come back home to their families. Now that I've covered some of the big picture top line discussions, I'd like to delve into some of the details. This bill funds a 4.6% pay raise for uniformed civilian uh, and personnel by further jeopardizing our men and women uh, by not having this, this pay raise. So this priority for the pay raise is really important. It provides nearly $1 billion also for sexual assault prevention and $193 million for suicide prevention. The Department of Defense is facing an aging nuclear triad. This bill continues to support the modernization of those forces as efficiently and as safely as possible. Because the climate crisis is a national security priority, the MARC includes $2.5 billion to address that. We include this funding because improving our facilities and investing in energy efficiency will save taxpayers billions, billions of dollars in the future. And nowhere is the environment changing faster than in the Arctic. And our investments will be challenged there by uh, China, and so will our interests, which already calls itself a near-Arctic nation. And Russia, we know, is an ever-present threat. These critical investments will make us more secure. And as I said, Ukraine is a priority for all of us and for democracies around the world. The bill provides $300 million for the Ukrainian Security Assistance Initiative, which is the same level as last year. In the second supplemental, as I pointed out, this program received money. It received $6 billion. Additionally, Ukraine is receiving eight excuse me, Ukraine is receiving $11 billion in weapons we are sending through draw, Drawdown Authority. 
At this point, the priority is for the tax dollars we've already appropriated to be used to provide ammunition and other critical weapons and supplies. We are also continuing to support allies in Eastern Europe with $225 million for the Baltic Security Initiative, $45 million more than last year, and increases above the administration's request for Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and Georgia. We must do everything possible to work with our allies in supporting Ukraine's fight for freedom. This is the first year without funding for Afghani, Afghani security forces in more than 20 years. And so it's well past time to also close the detention center in Guantanamo Bay. Section 8139 of the bill prohibits funds from being used to operate the detention facility after 2023. And finally, this bill carries out our constitutional responsibilities. In this legislation, I made 624 separate reductions to budget requests, some as large as $90 million and some as small as $23,000. Every tax dollar that the department spends must be justified. And the president is welcome to propose whatever he wishes, but we will determine how the funds are spent. And because the department and the intelligence community have ignored certain congressional requirements, funds are withheld until the administration complies with our directives. Before I close, I'd like to thank the staff from both sides of the aisle for their work. Um, I will uh, just say that they worked tirelessly and they haven't had a break because of the failure for us to get our bills done on time. This year, I'm hoping that we don't have that happen. So I'd like to thank my personal staff as well. I strongly urge support for this bill, and Madam Chair, I yield back. I would now like to recognize the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Calvin. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chair McCollum. I would like to first uh, commend uh, Chair McCollum for your diligent and detailed work in crafting uh, this bill before us today. I'd like to recognize and thank all the members of the subcommittee for their hard work and commitment to national security. Since March, we've had 18 hearings with senior leaders to consider the needs of the Department of Defense. This work, along with careful budget analysis done by staff and members of the committee, culminates in today's markup of the Department of Defense Appropriation Act for fiscal year 2023. Additionally, over the last five months, this committee has done all that it can to support the free and democratic nation of Ukraine. But these actions should not be mistaken for success. This administration's national defense policy of integrated deterrence has failed, and American taxpayers is shouldering the burden of over $50 billion in spending because of it. In April of 2021, Russia had more troops on Ukraine's border than any time since 2014 when it annexed Ukraine's uh, Crimean Peninsula. This president did nothing. Actually, he did worse than nothing. For months, he told the Russians exactly what he would or would not do, further eroding America's position. On February 24, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine, causing tens of thousands of deaths and the largest refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. The goal of strategic deterrence is to dissuade adversaries from launching an attack. This president's transparent military strategy, underfunded budget requests, and his focus on everything but lethality gave Putin the opportunity he needed to seize the moment. Weakness is provocative. And this Congress must ensure that the failure to deter Russia is not repeated in Taiwan or anywhere else that sovereign nations seek freedom from coercive and expansionist powers. We can avoid further chaos by sending a strong message to our adversaries and allies with a defense bill that meets our global requirements. As we consider this bill today, there are many parts of this bill that I can strongly support, including a 4.6% pay raise for uniformed personnel, key investments in advanced, uh, advanced uh, technologies, additional support for our partners like Ukraine. The chair also included many priorities for Republican members 
of uh, both this committee and the conference at large, for which I thank her. However, I'm deeply troubled that this bill also includes many proposals that will not garner any bipartisan support. This includes closing the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, the decreased investment in one of our Air Force hypersonic missile programs, excessive funding for climate change programs, and a general provision regarding abortion. Most importantly, I want to reiterate my opposition to the top-line amount proposed by both the administration and this bill. With inflation at 8.6 percent, this bill proposes an effective cut to the DOD at a time when it needs increased funding the most. Republicans support a budget framework that is strategy-driven and laser-focused on the threat environment. Failing to increase the top line will directly result in a loss of combat capability and readiness. Without additional funding, we cannot procure additional fifth-generation fighters, more ships for our naval fleet, or more training that our warfighters need to be ready in any conflict. We also know that the record high inflation, the funding proposal uh, in, this, uh, in this bill, will be inadequate to fully resource the quantities requested, while the Department has promised to send us updated cost estimates across the procurement accounts they have yet failed to do so. Uh, however, inflation isn't the only impacting procurement. It is also adversely impacting our service members and their families. I believe that more work needs to be done to mitigate the impacts of increased costs to our service members and their families, such as food and fuel. I look forward to working more with the Chair on this issue. Looking around the globe, it's easy to see that we need to do more to improve our strategic posturing. China is rapidly developing its naval fleet. It just launched its third most capable aircraft carrier. Russia has brutally and illegally invaded Ukraine, and North Korea is continuing to develop a nuclear arsenal. Throughout this year, we have heard from geographic combat commanders, combatant commanders, who have reiterated the need for resources to counter these adversaries. We cannot take our military superiority for granted. We must invest now and wisely to ensure that we can meet the threat and, most importantly, maintain peace. Well, I thank the Chair for her hard work in drafting the bill before us today. My colleagues and I will continue to oppose a bill that does not adequately resource our warfighting needs. As President and five-star General Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, the only way to win the next world war is to prevent it. The only way to do that is with a fully funded and ready U.S. military. Again, I'd like to thank the chair. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the majority staff and the minority staff for their hard work, specifically uh, for the minority, Johnny uh, Camberley, Nick uh, Vance, <coughs> Kia Batakamani, pronounced that correctly, Jamie McCormick, Mike McKay, and Lisa Kettner. With that, I yield. <coughs> Thank the gentleman, and now I would like to recognize myself for opening remarks. I want to say a thank you to you, Chairwoman McCollum, and to Ranking Member Calvert, and all of the members of the subcommittee for your efforts on the defense bill that is before us. And thank you to all of the subcommittee staff. Your dedication to our security, our global leadership, and our military readiness are reflected in this bill. Threats to our national security and against global democracy from adversaries around the world are growing and require a powerful response. As we protect our standing abroad, we must simultaneously confront the changing realities impacting our service members at home. This bill ensures that we are capable to do this. We will be even better prepared to protect ourselves and support our allies while honoring our women and men in uniform. This bill was also informed by 18 hearings, I might add the most of any subcommittee, on everything from the posture of the military's combatant commands and medical readiness to environmental restoration and the changing needs of the intelligence community. I am proud of this bill, which provides nearly $762 billion in discretionary spending, an increase of over $33 billion above 2022. It is noteworthy 
that this would be the second year in a row that this subcommittee's bill has grown by $33 billion, providing the Department of Defense with a level of funding $66 billion higher than in 2021. And that doesn't even account for the $27 billion in additional emergency funding provided across both Ukraine supplementals. And that totals up to about $93 billion for defense. And although we are currently discussing the defense appropriations bill, I want to remind my colleagues that this funding is in addition to the tens of billions of dollars in defense spending in other bills. We invest in the working and living conditions of members of the military in the Military Construction Veterans Affairs Bill. We address important defense-related environmental concerns and nuclear nonproliferation in the Energy and Water Development Bill. And we shore up anti-terrorism and cybersecurity efforts in the Commerce, Justice, Science, and the Homeland Security Bills. As we begin to debate this bill and move it through the committee consideration, I want to make it abundantly clear that the top line funding level in this bill is in line with President Biden's budget request and endorsed, I might add, by Secretary, Defense, uh, Secretary of Defense General Austin when he testified before our committee earlier this year. It was developed with the deepest concern for our national security and with a commitment to protect our nation and to confront any threat that may come our way. I might also add that in, in, in view of the commentary on inflation, I think it's important to note that inflation, uh, that the inflation does not depreciate the value of defense spending on a dollar for dollar basis. In many cases, DOD's contractual arrangements actually insulate the Pentagon from effects of inflation. Um, and that's why we have given thoughtful consideration, uh, as the Chair McCollum has pointed out. And what we shouldn't do is uh, uh, try to uh, deal with opportunism of leveraging rising prices uh, to make our case in terms of thoughtful consideration of increasing the defense budget, um, which uh, we, are, we are doing. I also might add that the effects of inflation uh, affect the Pentagon as well as um, the high cost of living on, uh, on individuals' checkbooks. Middle class, working families, small businesses, the vulnerable who are working hard, especially need a lifetime. Just a couple of points. If inflation affects the Pentagon, it also affects our farmers. That's why we're going to consider critical investments for food and nutrition services in agriculture in tomorrow's markup. If inflation affects the Pentagon, it affects health care. And that is the moral imperative that we have to deal with robust funding for veterans' medical care and uh, public health supports uh, provided by the Department of Health and Human Services. If inflation affects the Pentagon, it affects domestic infrastructure, including household, uh, including housing uh, as well. So it is inflation does not have a border on one set of, of, of programs um, uh, 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 that we take up in our consideration. It has a much broader context. Um, we are seeing, by the way, um, that we need to deal, at, as this bill does, with our national security, protect our nation, to confront any threat that comes our way. We are seeing this need play out on the global stage right now. Vladimir Putin's unyielding pursuit of power, Russia's attack on Ukrainian democracy, requires strong funding for DOD and the intelligence community. As we support the Ukraine and other allies abroad, we are continuing to provide critical security assistance in the form of training, military equipment, and increased intelligence support. Alongside funding to respond to Russian attacks on global democracy, the bill invests in our responses to China's aggression around the world with robust funding to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific. As the existential threat of climate continues to impact our security and our military readiness, the bill invests $2.5 billion in clean energy, climate adaptation initiatives that protects our facilities, the viability of our military installations, and global security. And to ensure that we continue to be at the forefront of military innovation, this bill includes significant funding for research and development programs 
The funds are also essential to maintaining our domestic advanced manufacturing base, which sustains millions of American jobs and grows our economy. And as we invest in programs that keep Americans safe, we also uphold our nation's values with language to close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay and by limiting U.S. involvement in Yemen. Upholding these values means ensuring that our military personnel and those who support them are paid a living wage. This bill prioritizes working families by requiring contractors to pay a $15 minimum wage and by providing the investments necessary to fund the proposed 4.6 military pay raise. At the same time, we are improving educational opportunities, child care available to service members and their families, $300 million to support construction of public schools on military bases. We are increasing funding for the maintenance of child care development centers, increasing pay for the employees that support them. Every single person who protects us deserves protection from the assault and harassment, something tragically but viciously common in the military. This bill addresses violence against women by tackling sexual assault and harassment in the military with $479 million to implement the necessary and recommended changes of the Independent Review Commission on Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment. It supports the mental health of those who serve with suicide prevention funds, directs DOD to address extremist ideologies, including white supremacy. The bill makes investments that meet current challenges and prepare us for the future. We live up to our moral responsibility to support our allies and service members and proud of this bill. Again, I thank the chairwoman and ranking member, and also I want to express my thanks to Chris Bigelow and the, all the majority staff, Kyle McFarland, Jason Gray, Jackie Ripke, Jennifer Chartrand, Matt Bauer, Walter Hearn, David Bortnick, Ariana Sarar, Hayden Milberg, Bill, Bill Atkins, Shannon Richter, Paul Kilbride, and Johnny Caberly, and all of the minority staff, Nick Vance, Jamie McCormick, and Kaya uh, batman Gledge. And I would now recognize Ranking Member Granger for her opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding. First, I want to thank Chair McCollum and Ranking Member Calvert for their work on the fiscal year 2023 Defense Appropriation Bill. As the former chair of this subcommittee, I know how much hard work went into drafting this bill, and I also want to acknowledge the committee staff. I appreciate that Chair McCollum has included many Republican priorities in this bill. I know this was not easy because your allocation is so low. Since the first day I was sworn in as a member of Congress, I have made clear that my top priority is to provide our national, provide for our national defense. Not only is it a responsibility given to us by the Constitution, it is the only way to protect the very freedoms that make this the greatest country in the world. I'm concerned that the administration's request for defense spending is dangerously low and fails to prioritize spending on vital national security programs. At a time when China is rapidly modernizing, Russia is invading a sovereign nation, and North Korea continues to fire missiles, the funding in the bill is not enough. The military services requested more than $21 billion in their unfunded priorities, and we know even that number is artificially low. Because the President's defense request is lacking, this bill fails to add any additional F-35 fighter jets. The Navy and Air Force have been fa facing a shortfall for years. We should be increasing production, not redu reducing. At a time when China is producing their next generation aircraft and is becoming increasingly aggressive, we must rapidly invest in advanced warfare capabilities. In addition to my concerns about the spending level, the majority has included partisan riders that will never be supported by members on our side of the aisle. These riders include a new general provision about leave policies related to abortion and a requirement to close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. Our military leadership has made it clear that continuing resolutions are very bad for the Department of Defense and our military services. By moving this important bill through the committee, 
and to the floor, we can start the necessary work of improving it so it can be, become law. We must get the Department of Defense the funding they need to protect the American people and our allies. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. I want to thank uh, Chairwoman McCollum and Ranking Member Calvert for their diligent work in crafting and bringing forward this critical legislation. And the United States and our allies face growing threats from tyrants in places like Russia, China, and other locations. And while our nation positions in this new era to defend democracy and freedom around the world, our defense also faces growing challenges related to domestic manufacturing, climate change, mental health and readiness, cybersecurity, workforce shortages, and more. With these challenges in mind, the Chair's mark meets the moment by striking the appropriate balance for America's defense. It responsibly assures national security while prudently expending taxpayer dollars in the midst of the wake of a pandemic and supply chain challenges that continue. The bill also promotes force modernization by investing in future capabilities. I particularly want to thank the Chair for her keen attention to developing U.S. hypersonic testing capabilities and the infrastructure necessary for Space Force technology testing. I'm also grateful for her continuing support of energy independence for our nation and advanced investments in nuclear, hydrogen, solar research, expanding photovoltaic technologies, and increasing the energy efficiency of America's armed forces and its bases in our nation and around the world. This bill also includes critical funding for the National Guard. And I applaud the increased support for the State Partnership Program and the Space Mission Cross-Training Initiative. Initially, uh, additionally, I appreciate the support for the Youth Challenge Program and Starbase Youth Outreach Program, so vital to energize the aspiring generation. Less than 1% of America's families now have a direct relationship to the U.S. military. These youth-focused programs strengthen U.S. bilateral relations to ensure our youth are aware of and made ready for these rewarding, exciting careers of the future. The bill continues our commitment to NATO, and our European allies, including Ukraine, and advances priorities to assure America's global leadership in an environment of evolving threats and hybrid warfare. This committee has been steadfast in its support for Ukraine as it fights for its sovereignty and freedom. No nation in the world has done more to help Ukraine than the United States of America. Finally, I want to recognize the Department of Defense's most important assets, the men and women who serve our nation. We salute them for their tireless dedication for, protect, for protecting America. This bill honors their noble service by providing the resources they need wherever they are, at home and around the world, although I still think we could do a whole lot better on their meals everywhere at these bases I visited. And again, I appreciate Chairwoman McCollum and Ranking Member Calvert for their diligent work on this bill and for incorporating these and many other priorities and urge its support. Let's move ahead. I yield. I, I hope the, the meals here are satisfactory, Congresswoman Kaptur here. So, <laughs> Mr. Stewart, Congressman Stewart. Madam Chair, thank you. I rise in a bipartisan fashion for something that has been bipartisan for a long time here, including with members of this committee, and that is as a co-chair of the, again, bipartisan F-35 caucus. As a former Air Force pilot, I understand, I think, the incredible capabilities of this aircraft. And they're really very difficult to describe. I could illustrate it with this very simple example. My father was a pilot in World War II. These are actually his pilot wings. I wear them proudly. One time he came with me and sat in the cockpit of a B-1, and he was just blown away by the sophistication of it. Of course, it'd be hard for someone who flew old airplanes like World War II to sit in a modern aircraft like the B-1. I had a similar experience when I sat in the cockpit of the F-35. I was then blown away by the incredible advancement in technology. This isn't just an incredible combat aircraft, it's a force multiplier. 
It changes the dynamics of aerial combat. And once again, it's been supported in a bipartisan fashion. 154 members, Republicans and Democrats. Further, and I think this is an important point, it's employed in the use of three of our services, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps. And our service chiefs have said that they need, the first unfunded request that they, uh, top priority they have is for the 19 additional F-35. I don't understand how a major weapon system such as this could undergo a 35% reduction. We're going from 61 aircraft, I'm sorry, from 94 aircraft to 61. And I would just ask, as the appropriation process moves forward, I would urge members here on this committee, particularly leadership, and those who will have an, a, a, uh, an inordinate say in the outcome, to consider the additional funding for the F-35s. Get us back to the original 94 aircraft. It's essential for our national security that we maintain the technological edge that these aircraft provide. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. I also might add that there was, an, and I support the F-35s. I come from a defense-dependent state, so I am for defense spending. But there's $280 million, as I understand it, for the F-35 program. If there's more information that you need about that, I suggest that the staff is available to answer any questions. But, and how proud you must be in wearing the wings. So listen, we congratulate to you on that. Ms. Bustos. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd also like to thank Chair McCollum for your hard work on this and Ranking Member Calvert for your hard work and certainly the staff as well uh, for, for getting this bill to where we are today. Um, this is my last defense bill because I'm not running for re-election. And I figure this is also my last shot to bring up once again the Rock Island Arsenal. I see Derek Kilmer mimicking that I was going to bring up the Rock Island Arsenal, which sits right in the middle of the Mississippi River between Iowa and Illinois. Um, so this bill that uh, is presented to us here today includes $20 million to continue additive manufacturing research into a jointless hull for the next generation combat vehicle. This uh, research that's being done at the Army's Center of Excellence for Additive and Advanced Manufacturing, which Senator Durbin and I helped establish back in uh, 2018, um, now uh, has this funding that will be used to construct the largest 3D printer in the world, not just in the nation, but in the world. And it will be capable, listen to this, of printing metal parts that are up to 30 feet long, 20 feet wide, and 12 feet tall. This is from a printer. And um, as an added bonus, this 3D printer is, uh, is being manufactured by Ingersoll Machine Tool in Rockford, Illinois, which is also in the congressional district that I serve. So when completed later this year, the, print, the printer will be located at the Rock Island Arsenal. This funding is an investment in the safety of our soldiers, the future of our Army, and the security of our nation. But it's also an investment in working communities like the ones I represent in northern, western, and central Illinois. So thank you very much again for your hard work on this. And with that, I yield back. Thanks, the gentlelady. Now we recognize Congressman Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I want to thank the committee and the staff for pulling this together. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, support this bill as written with these numbers, especially. Uh, the, the purpose of the military, especially the U.S. military, is twofold. One is to deter, and in the event of failed deterrence, to, to win, uh, to win a war. It needs to be anchored to a threat, a real-world scenario, uh, and in this case, I don't think that the budget request nor the numbers that we're seeing in the programs we're talking about are anchored to the pacing threat, which for us is, is uh, the Chinese Communist government. Uh, I do agree with uh, Chairwoman McCollum that, that, that diplomacy is the key ingredient uh, to establishing and maintaining a peace. But in, in engaging in diplomacy without a legitimate and strong deterrence behind it is a very lonely and, and deadly game. Uh, our weak military relative to our peers, in this case relative to China, actually undermines diplomacy and pretending to engage in diplomacy without a meaningful deterrence and without a strong military behind it is akin to a child waving a red cape in front of a bull and pretending to be a bullfighter. It actually provokes violence. 
And so I think we need to look at what we're funding here. We need to look at what we're prioritizing and make sure that it is anchored to the pacing threat of the Chinese Communist government. Uh, despite the $200 billion over the last eight years and increases that uh, Chairwoman McCollum referenced, we are still lagging China in several domains, especially lagging them in the pace of change in their development programs and uh, lagging them in terms of capacity overall. In 2022, the Chinese government increased their defense budget by 7.1 percent, uh, and this is effectively us communicating to the world that we don't recognize that increase and we're not willing to match that in, in spades. Uh, the massive uh, capacity problem that we have is taking the shape of many forms. Uh, one is shipbuilding. Uh, China is building r roughly two new ships per month that they're putting to sea, whereas as a nation we are actually on aggregate losing ships every year within our naval, naval forces. We have a massive strike fighter gap uh, with not enough aircraft on the ramps to meet the demands that we currently have, much less the future demands. By 2025, China will have 500 J-20s and FC-31s, which is their version of the F-35 and F-22, their fifth generation aircraft. This 500 quantity represents an, uh, a larger number than we have currently fielded in that time frame. And in our budget, we're striking uh, roughly a third of the F-35s requested. We also have no request for the F-18 Super Hornets, which is a massive problem in terms of aggravating the strike fighter gap. We're making cuts to significant uh, electronic warfare programs, such as the next generation jammer for the U.S. Navy. We're not keeping pace with the development and the build rate and the development efforts of the hypersonic weapons that we desperately need and are lagging not only against China, but also against Russia. We're not building the UAVs, the unmanned aerial vehicles that we need to at the capacity with the technologies that we need to to keep pace with China. And we're certainly not investing in the cyber domain, both offensive and defensive, uh, uh, relative to China. Uh, and the thing that I think bugs me the most as a prior military service member, as an officer in the U.S. Navy, is that we're not investing in our service members. We, we have these platitudes and niceties talking about pay raises for our troops. But 4.6 percent, even though that's a lot more than historical pay raises over the last, call it, five years, is still only about half of what we're seeing relative to inflation. And we still have a significant chunk of our troops, uh, especially the enlisted, junior enlisted personnel, E3 and below, who are actually living below the poverty line and going lower, uh, some of them on food stamps. We have an all-volunteer force, and if we want to attract the best troops, the best personnel, especially in this modern uh, domain that we're fighting multiple uh, uh, potential threats, we, we've got to be able to attract that talent. We, we have in this bill provisions for contractors to impose a minimum wage salary, but we don't do the same for our own service members, uh, and that will be the basis of the amendment I'll offer later. Uh, but overall, we need to invest in our troops. We need to invest in our equipment. Over the last 20 years with the global war on terror and these low-intensity conflicts, we have driven both into the ground uh, while China has continued to invest in their military and their capacity. I yield back. Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I want to take a moment to thank Chair McCollum and Ranking Member Calvert for their leadership on the bill before us, which makes strong investments in our national security and invest in America's safety at home and abroad. The safety and success of our troops is dependent upon support from Congress, and this bill does that. It also honors the sacrifice of our service members with a $6.2 billion increase for military personnel, which provides the funding for a 4.6 pay increase across the military. That's something every one of us, both Democrats and Republicans, can go back to our districts and talk about. Last year, this committee passed a defense appropriations bill that called out sexual assault and gender-based violence in the military for what it is, a crisis. In this year's bill, we continue that critical work with nearly a billion dollars for the sexual assault program, which includes nearly half a billion dollars to implement the Independent Review Commission's recommendations. This bill also comes at a crucial time while the people of Ukraine are fighting to protect their homes and their futures. Russia's unprovoked, immoral, and illegal invasion is rightly being met with international condemnation. This bill will provide further security assistance to Ukraine through training, equipment, weapons, supplies, and intelligence support, while also protecting our national security interests. This bill also supports Israel, our key democratic ally in the Middle East. It provides $500 million for the life-saving missile defense systems, including the Iron Dome, which intercepts rockets, mortars, and artillery aimed at civilian populations. 
Ensuring that Israel maintains her qualitative military edge is critical to stability in the Middle East and our own national security. We're also funding life-saving science with a $582.5 million investment in peer-reviewed cancer research. This includes $150 million for breast cancer research and $110 million for prostate cancer research. I'm particularly glad that this bill prioritizes metastatic cancer research and places more emphasis on the need for diverse representation of patients in clinical trials. It is estimated that metastatic cancer is responsible for about 90% of cancer deaths. The language in this bill will help us fight the most advanced stage of, stages of cancer and will prioritize patient awareness and survivorship planning to improve patient outcomes. As a breast cancer survivor, I deeply appreciate that. Finally, I appreciate that the bill includes $1.4 billion for environmental restora restoration, including $15 million for an assessment of the health implications of PFOS and PFOA. This is an issue that I care deeply about because I've spoken to so many veterans about the horrible and unexpected health problems that they and their families have likely suffered due to PFAS water contamination. I'm glad we're continuing our work on this issue in both the Defense Appropriations Bill and the Military Construction and VA Appropriations Bill, which we'll mark up tomorrow. I look forward to seeing this bill come to the floor, and I yield back the balance of my time. I just make one comment to, uh, to Congressman Garcia. I just asked about the information. The Navy requested eight combat ships, which is what is uh, uh, been budgeted here, and Congresswoman McCollum will address that issue uh, la later on. But we met the Navy's request. Eight combat ships are there. And with that, Congressman Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to begin uh, as a member of this subcommittee and congratulating the chair and the ranking member, not only for working together so well, but honestly just for the tone they set in the subcommittee. You know, uh, I think we're a very bipartisan committee overall. I think probably defense approach is the most bipartisan of the committees. And I uh, commend again the chair and the ranking member for working together so well uh, that we got a bill earlier this year and have something to consider before us today. Uh, but I also want to, uh, and there are a number of things I want to add quickly that I really appreciate in the bill. The extra money for the Paladin Integrated Management Program, very important in updating our artillery. There are important investments here for artillery deployment, air defense artillery. Uh, again, there's a lot of good things in this bill, and a lot of constructive dialogues already occurred. And it's worth noting we're in a process. We're not going to make the final decision today. We're going to move a bill out. We're going to continue to negotiate. This bill is going to evolve just as it did last year as we go forward. But I do want to associate myself with the concerns expressed by the ranking member of the full committee and the SCUB committee in two areas. The first and the most important one is we simply are underinvesting here. That's just simply the reality. We're doing a lot. I'm proud of what we've done over the last couple of years. But frankly, I don't think the Russians and the Chinese are that impressed with what we've done. Their investments are outpacing ours, particularly the Chinese, and that's very important. Second, I am concerned. I, I share my friend Mr. Stewart's uh, uh, concerns about the F-35. We've been steadily uh, increasing those numbers for eight years, but this is the lowest number of increases. Uh, in previous years, it's been 85 to as many as 98. This, as my friend said, is 61. It's simply not enough to keep up with what we're facing uh, abroad. So uh, as I hope the... Uh, number goes up, I think if you'll look at the unmet needs uh, that have been laid out by our own service chiefs, you'll see areas of investment that need to be made. At the end of the day, the number's too low. The investments uh, that we need to make are pressing, and frankly, our adversaries uh, overseas are going to take a look at what we're doing and make their plans accordingly. We've seen that happen in the Ukraine, sadly, this year. I don't want to see it happen in East Asia next year. With that, again, I commend the chair and the ranking member for the worry they work together. I'm comfortable at the end of the day we'll get to something we can all support. I look forward to working with the chair and the ranking member to achieve that. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Congressman Espayat. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, there seems to be a bipartisan consensus in this Congress to support uh, this appropriations bill, uh, especially as war rages in the Ukraine. Um, I hope that we can all achieve bipartisan consensus also to increase funding for education, COVID, uh, COVID release uh, efforts, health care, crime prevention initiative, and programs that help hardworking families who are struggling to get by. 
I will be voting in favor of this bill at this committee level because it contains several important provisions, including at least $5 million to expand Fisher housing. My district has a Fisher house in the Bronx which supports veteran families of patients receiving care at the James J. Peters VA Medical Center. It also has $2.5 billion in clean energy and climate adaptation to protect facilities readiness and global security. It includes more than $500 million to address violence against women with funding to tackle sexual assault in the military. It also closes the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, it limits our involvement in Yemen and protects the reproductive rights of service members. While these are all important measures, I want to make clear that I support decreasing the defense budget so that we can reallocate those funds to programs that invest in programs that expand our social infrastructure and opportunities for families in our society. Thank you, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Rogers, we see you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, as well as uh, Chairman McCollum, Ranking Member Granger, and Ranking Member Calvert. Thank you for your hard work uh, to craft this uh, big piece of legislation. I'm very appreciative of the majority's efforts to uh, accommodate the minority requests. Uh, it's clear you took input from many members of the committee and the House, and this bill reflects that. But while there are many uh, good aspects of this bill, the bad, unfortunately, outweighs the good. Uh, as many of my colleagues have noted, the level of defense spending is simply too low, especially when considering the record levels of inflation that we are now seeing and can anticipate. Last year at this very markup, uh, I warned the committee to not ease up on our defense spending and be prepared for potential global conflict. Well, much to my chagrin, I think we've all seen what can happen if we fall asleep at the wheel, which I think we have done. What Russia has done to Ukraine demonstrates how swiftly our adversaries can act, and we must continually uh, robustly fund our military so that we are prepared to respond to the worst of circumstances. I'd also like to thank the committee for including strong provisions related to the DOD electronic health record system, requiring it to operate seamlessly with the VA record it's clear that this is also a priority for you and many other members of this uh, committee. As many of you are aware, I've been working to ensure the DOD and VA have fully interoperable health records since 2009, 12 long years. This issue is personal. I've told this story time and again, but one of my constituents lost his sight because the VA did not have access to his DOD records. It's simply unconscionable and unacceptable. I know this would not happen today since we're now closer to fully uh, interoperability uh, between DOD and VA than we've ever been. As the DOD and VA electronic health record systems begin full deployment, it is essential that we as a committee keep our finger on the pulse of the situation and ensure that this program reaches the finish line in a timely fashion. And this bill uh, helps us do uh, exactly that. So while there are many good aspects in this bill, the bad unfortunately outweighs the good. The overall top line increase is less than inflation and takes from the critical defense centered programs. Thank you, and I yield back. <coughs> Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to echo the gratitude to our chair and to the ranking member and to the staff of the subcommittee for their great work on this bill. Um, there are a number of big wins for the folks that I represent, for service members, for military families, 
Uh, but in the interest of time, I just want to quickly uh, point out two, two things that I think really matter. First, this legislation is a win for our public shipyards and for the vital work that they do to support our national security. Uh, this bill provides robust funding for the Navy's Shipyard uh, Infrastructure Optimization Program, or SIOP, which is a 20-year effort to upgrade and modernize our nation's shipyards, uh, our four public shipyards, including Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in my neck of the woods. Uh, listen, without these investments, our efforts to protect American interests at home and across the world will be severely impacted. Uh, and fortunately, this funding gets the ball rolling on making sure that our shipyards are modern and capable and ensures that our uniform and civilian uh, folks working at our public yards can quickly and safely get our subs and our carriers back into service. Uh, the second thing I want to mention real quickly is this bill is a win for local communities that support our military installations. There is additional funding in this bill for the Defense Community Infrastructure Program, or DSIP. These funds are used to plan and implement infrastructure projects that improve the quality of life for people, including civilians and members of the armed, armed services and their families. They support things like school construction and commuter workforce issues and childcare facilities, and those things that are often under a strain when we see an increase in uh, the presence of our military installations. That's a big deal uh, for military communities around our country, including Bremerton, Washington, and my neck of the woods. So uh, I want to thank the chair and the ranking member and the staff again for including uh, these important priorities. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Ropersberger. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman McCollum, ranking member Calvert, and the hardworking staff on the committee putting together this bill for fiscal year 2023. I know the staff worked tirelessly to include as many member uh, priorities as possible. I sincerely appreciate these efforts to ensure our nation has the tools it requires to meet current and future threats. As highlighted by Chairwoman McCollum and full committee chair Delora, it is of great importance that this bill passes on time to properly resource the Department of Defense and intelligence community to protect Americans both here at home and abroad. This spending bill provides vital security assistance to Ukraine and funds for training equipment, weapons, supplies, and intelligence support to the Ukrainian men and women in uniform. Additionally, the legislation addresses the rise of great power competition we face today by bolstering our power projection into the Indo-Pacific and investigating in integrated deterrence to counter the pacing threat of China. The bill also takes care of our military personnel by providing our service members a pay raise, protects our lands with critical environmental programs like the Readiness and Environmental Protection uh, Integration Program, and continues to support the research community to help ensure our forces are ready to meet tomorrow's challenges. I thank chair and ranking member for their funding of my priorities such as Naval Academy infrastructure uh, investments, medical research, and the continued research and development of emerging technologies and capabilities. I've long been a strong ally of our national security departments, agencies, and programs. I will continue to support the Department of Defense and vote for this bill. I encourage all members to support this bill. Let's do everything we can to give the Pentagon to give the Pentagon on time and predictable appropriations. I yield back. Mr. Case. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, to Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Granger, and Ranking Member Calvert for your leadership on this bill. I stand in strong support of this year's defense spending bill and urge the full committee's full support. Uh, this bill addresses our national security challenges, especially in my part of the world, that the Indo-Pacific and my Hawaii's continued critical ro role in it. I especially want to thank the committee's support for two specific issues, the Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage Facility and the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. First, the eff continued efforts of this committee to fully address the inexcusable Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage crisis are invaluable. Your support is critical to the thousands of our service members and the hundreds of thousands of Hawaii residents and visitors who depend completely on the aquifer under Red Hill for our clean drinking water. 
we must continue to remediate the thousands of gallons of fuel that polluted and are likely still polluting our island of Oahu's drinking water. Recently, the Secretary of Defense ordered this facility closed. This is the right decision, and we must fund the Department's efforts over years uh, and provide regular oversight of its actions. The closure of the facility is also an opportunity for us to restructure the logistics of fuel storage in the most geographically challenged combatant command in our world. To this end, I wholeheartedly concur with this committee's decision to fully support the President's $1 billion fiscal year 2023 budget for Red Hill and to take action to provide effective oversight of Red Hill's remediation, defueling, closure, and replacement. Second, to amplify the comments of my colleague from Maryland, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, or PDI, continues to be a critical component of our military's efforts in the Indo-Pacific, especially to address our number one and growing geopolitical challenge, China. Now in its second year, PDI continues to evolve and mature as a cohesive series of investments that strengthen our presence throughout the region. This year, the administration submitted a budget of $6 billion for PDI, a necessary increase from last year's budget request. Further, we see a welcome and necessary shift from the department asking for purely platform-based acquisitions to request that strengthen our partnerships, increase exercises in the region, and, and improve our overall posture. PDI and other initiatives will reaffirm our bipartisan, nonpartisan commitment to the Indo-Pacific as a continued guarantor of the peace and international rules-based order of the last three generations. Third, I simply want to quickly fully incorporate my colleague from Washington's comments on the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Program, or SIOP. Our four public shipyards are critical to our overall defense effort throughout our world, um, and especially in the Indo-Pacific. In closing, I encourage this committee to approve this bill, which fulfills our commitments to address our modern-day challenges in the Indo-Pacific. These promises reaffirm our obligation to our service members, the communities they live in, and the commands responsible for answering the greatest threats to our national security. Mahalo, and I yield back. Congresswoman Torres is recognized. Yes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. This bill takes important steps to increase accountability over key programs, and I want to thank you and your staff for your tireless work on it. I am also thankful that several of my priorities were included. My constituent, 21-year-old Army paratrooper Enrique Ramon R Martinez, was murdered on Memorial Day weekend two years ago, and there has been no justice for his family. I am especially appreciative, uh, Chairwoman, of your support to add language on military code, cold cases and the military justice system to this report to ensure evidence does not fall through the cracks there is oversight and accountability of investigations and that we find justice for all victims and their families. And I am also pleased that increased oversight over our security cooperation with the Northern Triangle is included in this report, including language increasing coordination between DOD and state. In addition, there is language increasing restrictions on military assistance to the Northern Triangle region directing the department to withhold assistance for a unit that has used previous U.S. military assistance against U.S. personnel. Importantly, the language directs DOD to inform this committee when this misuse occurs. It, it also directs DOD to implement various improvements in its use in its end use monitoring system. We will have we still have a lot of improvements to make to ensure that no taxpayer funding is helping corrupt actors in the Northern Triangle instead of serving U.S. policy. But I am happy for this increased oversight, and I want to thank you once again and your staff for your support moving this forward. And I yield back. Congresswoman Lee of Nevada. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
I rise today in support of this funding bill. I want to thank uh, Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Calvert, the staff, uh, for including many of my priorities. Our service members and military families in Nevada face unique and uh, challenges and deserve all the support we can give them. And I've heard repeatedly from military families about the barriers that they have faced when accessing child care. Specifically, Air Force families in Nevada have expressed to me some serious limitations in the availability, the convenience, and the affordability of their child care options. In particular, I've spoken to families from Creech Air Force Base who often have incredibly irregular work schedules, very lengthy, lengthy commutes. This is a base with no on-base housing and often incredibly tight budgets. And they're currently forced to either travel long distances and choose between a number of limited, expensive, and inconvenient options. I'm very proud to have secured language in this bill that will require the Secretary of Defense to review existing child care fee assistance programs so we can better support military families. And I hope all of my colleagues will support this effort to help those families. And I'm very glad to see that this funding bill includes a military pay raise to ensure that our troops are paid fairly. And of course, I am glad to see robust funding for suicide prevention programs, as we know that active duty military members face unique mental health challenges that we must address. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I look forward to voting to support this bill. Thank you. Are there any other members wishing to make a general comment on the bill? Seeing no other member wishing to make opening remarks, I'd like to recognize Ms. McCollum to offer a manager's amendment. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. An amendment by Ms. McCollum. I ask unanimous consent to waive the reading, Madam Chair. Ms. McCollum is recognized. The manager's amendment, and all of you have a copy, it's a table that looks like this at, at, at your desk, um, incorporates various non-controversial items in the bill and the report that have been cleared by the majority and the minority. And I want to thank the members for working with us on the various issues that have been brought to our attention. I also want to thank all the staff once again who um, stayed, stayed late into the evening to make sure that this uh, manager's amendment would be able to um, be before you today. So with that, I urge adoption of the amendment. <laughs> Ranking Member Calvert is recognized. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of the amendment, uh, which makes several technical corrections, includes many other items that have been agreed upon in a bipartisan manner. There are two items I'd like to specifically highlight the first is report language supporting a partnership between the National Guard and Taiwan. As we've seen in Ukraine, it's critical that we provide our vulnerable partners with the support they need before a crisis occurs. As the Department considers the best way for the Guard to expand its cooperation with Taiwan, this language sends the message that we stand ready as a committee to support. Second, I strongly support the inclusion of report language regarding potentially moving Mexico from NORTHCOM area of responsibility to SOUTHCOM. My home state of California and elsewhere around the country, the security of citizens is more directly impacted by drug trafficking, human trafficking, money laundering, migrant smuggling along our southern border than anywhere else. Given the scope and sophistication of transnational criminal networks throughout the region, including their Chinese enablers, I think it makes a great deal of sense to assess whether our counter-drug efforts wouldn't be stronger by moving Mexico to the responsibility of the U.S. Southern Command. I urge the adoption of this amendment, and I yield back. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? I recognize Ms. McCollum for one minute to close. Um, Madam Chair, uh, once again, I want to thank the members for um, the way in which we worked together on this especially. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Calvert and, and his staff as well as our staff for the prompt
efficient work that they did in putting this amendment together, and I, I uh, would ask for its unanimous uh, support. The question is on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Mr. Calvert. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Yes, yes. Uh, this amendment would restore the $90 million cut to the Air Force Air Launched Rapid Response Weapon, otherwise known as Aero, in the research and development accounts. During our hearing this year, we heard the intelligence community, the Air Force, and our combatant commanders about the risk posed by Chinese and Russian hypersonic missiles. Because of this threat, all the services are rapidly developing hypersonic capabilities. Aero, which is one of the Air Force's two priority hypersonic weapon programs, integrates Air Force and DARPA-enabled technologies into a system that will be fielded as a critical long-range strike capability. I do not pretend that the development of these next-generation technologies is cheap or simple. The Air Force has stated that the total cost of the aero rapid prototyping is $1.57 billion. Further, the Air Force has a series of testing failures that led to the Secretary to hold off on re requesting procurement funding for fiscal year 2023. Because of these issues, I understand the logic behind the Chair's position to terminate the program. We as appropriators must ensure that the taxpayer funds are being spent wisely. However, I fundamentally disagree with this decision. The test flights planned for fiscal year 2023 helped the Air Force develop the full parameters of the weapon systems requirements, as well as implement the lessons learned from other programs. The Army is making progress on their ground launch hypersonic weapons program. However, just like our nuclear arsenal has always relied on diverse delivery systems to provide a credible deterrent, hypersonics is no different. We must continue to invest in air launch capability to cover the threat gaps we are already seeing. We have challenged the department to be disruptive and build leap ahead technologies to outpace our adversaries. We have always known that the perfecting a hypersonic weapon would not be easy and failure would be part of the process. However, defunding the aero program just as it had its first successful launch punishes the Air Force for taking chances and promotes a risk adverse culture that kills innovation. We are making rapid progress. Now is not the time to press the pause button. To offset this cost, I've identified four climate change related programs that can be reduced to focus on the core warfighting mission of the Department of Defense. These reductions include electric vehicle equipment installation and leasing, personnel to help DOD study and conduct climate change mitigation, carbon sequestration projects, and a smaller increase than proposed for the Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program. As appropriators, it is our job to prioritize the needs of the Department of Defense. It's clear to me that instead of focusing on climate change and other societal issues, we need to ensure that adequate funding is provided to continue the development and fielding of the capabilities that will bolster our warfighting capability and strategic deterrence in a conflict with a peer adversary. I urge the adoption of my amendment, and I yield back. Ms. McCollum is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to set the scene here for a few minutes on, on how I made the decision to uh, do what I did to the Air program. Last year, the Air Force requested $160 million to begin production of the Aero missile. That decision was expected to occur after a successful uh, completion of all the first round test flights. If you read last year's committee report, you will find that I expressed concern about the delays in the testing program. Those concerns turned out to be well-founded. After a series of test failures, the Air Force admitted, the Air Force admitted that they could not reach production decision in FY22. We have realigned a portion of the procurement money to help fund an extension of the testing program. Now, I'm well aware that the program recently announced that the successful completion of a second booster test flight. However, this test should have been completed a long, long time ago. Now, in fiscal year 2023, 
The Air Force has requested, the Air Force has requested only a very small amount of money in procurement, uh, $46.5 billion. And they included no funding, the Air Force included no funding in the outlying years. The Air Force has already asked the committee to realign the funding that they've requested in procurement. That means no production for the Arrow will begin in 2023. And apparently, not ever. We have given the Arrow program everything they need up until this point. However, if the Air Force, if the United States Air Force will not commit to this budget, to fielding this weapon, I see no reason to fully fund $115 million that they have requested for development. The, nine, the $90 million cut in this bill is intended to allow the Air Force to complete all the first roundup tests, but no more. The committee supports the department's efforts to field hypersonic weapon technology, but it's not a blank check. We will not support a hypersonic bridge to nowhere. I want to point out that this bill fully funds the Air Force's other hypersonic attack cruise missile at the request of $462 million. In addition, this bill provides $197 million above the request to satisfy an Air Force unfunded priority to enhance capability and capacity of the hypersonic test infrastructure, something that's critically important and needed. While we know uh, that not having access to testing infrastructure has been a significant factor in limiting the department's ability to field hypersonics. So overall, this bill provides $3.7 billion for hypersonic programs, an increase of $364 million above the request. But this bill also exercises proper oversight on behalf of the taxpayers. This amendment would restore the arrow funding uh, that's been offered. It would restore this funding by cutting climate change efforts. And I want to be clear. Climate change is an existential threat to our national security. The Department of Defense must act swiftly and boldly to take on this challenge and prepare for damage that cannot be avoided. Those were not my words. Those were the words of the Secretary of Defense, retired General Lloyd Austin. Our highest military leadership recognizes the critical importance of addressing climate change, but this amendment that's being offered does not. Climate change shapes the threat environment cause that's caused by instability. We have now seen firsthand how climate change can directly impact our military readiness and destructive impact of storms on military bases. We have spent millions of dollars to repair that. We know that our military is one of the largest consumers of energy resources in the entire world. We try to bring that down for the taxpayer and invest in R&D to make it more efficient for the military to fulfill its mission. This amendment would cut funds, in the words of the department, that would enhance operational capability, mission, resilience, and readiness. We funded the hypersonic programs that needed to be funded. One that failed to meet its obligation, yes, we cut back on. So I encourage people to uh, oppose this amendment, and um, I yield back, Madam Chair. Congresswoman Granger? No okay. Any others who wish to be heard uh, on this item? Dr. Harris? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. You know, as a uh, former naval officer, clearly hypersonic weapons are the, one of the greatest threats to our military security now. We should be advocating for an Operation Warp Speed on hypersonic weapons, both defensive and, as this amendment would do, offensively. We cannot lose ground. We are already behind the enemy in this. 
We can't lose ground. If the military is, is, is as the uh, chair of the subcommittee suggested, the military doesn't really want to do it, that's our job to say what, what, what the defense of this country needs. We need to do hypersonic research. They, they, if they need to be dragged kicking and screaming to it, we should do it. We should commit the dollars defensively and offensively. Our enemies already have this weapon. The Russians already have the weapon. Would, would the gentleman yield? Ab absolutely. I fund hypersonic weapons, but this is not a blank check for something that the Air Force isn't even making a priority to invest again. I agree with you. We need to be smart, we need to be fast, we need to be quick on this. And that is why um, I, I redirected a lot of the funding to go towards the one thing that there's a backlog on, and that's testing. And that's also testing for the Air Force hypersonics. So I don't think we disagree, but what I will say is that I won't agree on is that is to put money that's going to an ineffective, not meeting deadline, not ready for production hypersonic weapons when we have others in the queue that are meeting the mark. With that, I thank the gentleman for yielding. And, and, and uh, th thank, uh, thank the uh, chair of the subcommittee for that. Again, we, and I, I thank you for working on this and appreciating the threat that hypersonic weapons are to the United States. And I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to take part on the amendment? Stuart. Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair, and I would thank my friend, Mr. Calvert, for bringing this amendment forward. And I would just have one clarification to uh, just a misunderstanding that I think many people have. We often say, when we, when we talk about high technology and, and very advanced technology such as this, that China, which we know is ahead of us, and Russia, who we know is ahead of us, we say, well, they stole that technology from us. That is not true here. This is organically developed. China is a generation ahead of us in this technology, and it's not just a matter of us reconstituting a program that we decided to defund several years ago. We have to start from where, from the beginning on this nearly. And it's not just a matter of us picking up where we left off and going. We're so much further behind than, than I think most people understand. They didn't steal this technology from us. We don't have this technology. They developed it themselves, and we have to have urgency in trying to catch up to that. And with that, Madam Chair, I, I would yield back. Thank you. Are there any other members who would wish to, wish to be heard on this amendment? Seeing none, if there's no further, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Adderholt. Madam Chair, uh, in this issue, time is of the uh, uh, Mr. Calvert, Mr. Adderholt wanted oh, I'm to sorry, make a comment. Me. Sorry. I'll, I'll just take a second. I, I just wanted to uh, rise in support of the ranking member's amendment uh, on this issue. Uh, I think this system addresses a, uh, uh, our need for um, hypersonics, and uh, I think that uh, we would be certainly better off. So I just wanted to lend my voice of support to it to the ranking member as well. No further debate. The gentleman in California well, is Madam recognized Chair. for uh, the amendment to close. In this instance, uh, time is of the essence. Um, it's true that uh, China has not only uh, perfected this technology, but they've have procured it and they have hundreds of hypersonic missiles, which has put the United States at grave threat. Uh, the Air Force is being responsible, in my mind, by slowing the procurement funding to ensure we develop a capable weapon. And this is a different weapon than what the Army is, uh, is attempting to, uh, to procure at the present moment. Uh, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. We, not, we cannot lose valuable time in developing this type of an advanced technology. Uh, we, need, we need to procure it and, and, uh, and get it in the field as soon as possible. With that, I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And Madam Chair, I ask for a roll call vote. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Yes. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. No. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. 
Aye. 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 Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. Mr. Christ. Aye. Aye. Mr. Chris votes aye. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Kaptur. No. Ms. Kaptur votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. No, thank you. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roy Allard. Ms. Roy Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. No. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. No. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Va Mr. Valadeo. Aye. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. no. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? On this vote, the, eye, the ayes are 27, the nays are 31, and the amendment is not adopted. Yeah. Are there further any further amendments? Mr. diaz Ballard. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I have an amendment on the desk. Yes. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment from Mr. diaz Ballard. I would ask the amendment. Without objection, the reading amendment is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm offering an amendment to return the bill to current law. Current law, uh, when it deals with uh, our operations in the detention facility of the terrorist detention facility in Guantanamo Bay. My amendment would strike uh, provisions in the bill that prohibit funding for operations of that said facility uh, after September 30th, 2023. 
Uh, it would also restore provisions uh, on the Guantanamo detention facility that had been long-standing bipartisan provisions in this bill, by the way, including in the bill that, again, uh, just became law uh, that we just finished just months ago. Uh, again, these common sense provisions include limiting uh, the transfer of those very dangerous remaining terrorists in Guantanamo Bay in the detention. That includes, by the way, Khalid, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who I don't have to tell you all here, was the architect of 9-11, of the attacks on 9-11. In its most recent report to Congress, uh, the Director of National Intelligence assessed that 17%, 17% of those that were formally detained and Gitmo and that were released or transferred ended up again back uh, with their usual ways, uh, their terrorist activities. And by the way, the estimate is that another 14.3 above that may have also done the same thing. So again, uh, you know, the, the, let's get something straight. The catastrophic deadly withdrawal from Afghanistan does nothing or did nothing to minimize the risk or to frankly minimize the need for a detention facility outside of the United States to hold these the most dangerous terrorists on the planet. This is a common sense uh, approach. This is something that has received time and time again bipartisan support. I would ask for, again, once again, that bipartisan support that we do it now, because otherwise uh, I suspect that it will be done in conference anyways. With that, I yield back. Ms. McCollum is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I rise in opposition to the amendment. Two years ago, uh, Ranking Member Calvert, Mr. Carter, uh, and I visited Guantanamo Bay. And we went there to review the naval base, the prison facilities, which are aging and underutilizing. And I might add, we also looked at the housing infrastructure for the, the men and women who are stationed there, and it's not good. Our government is spending over $200 million every year to guard 37 detainees whose average age is 43. That's more than $5 million per detainee. Now, neither the Department of Defense or any member of the House of Representatives requested that we include provisions of the gentleman's amendment in the bill this year. And I want to be clear, moving these detainees will not change their current status. In 2014, a determination by the Department of Justice stated that transferring detainees to U.S. soil, and we're talking about maximum security prisons, would not change status under the law of war, and they would not gain any new rights. So this amendment is a solution in search of a problem. I'm in search of spending the taxpayers' dollars wisely. The war in Afghanistan has ended. Our troops are home. And now it is time to close this facility, and that's exactly what we would do in this bill. And I thank the chairwoman, and I yield back. Congressman Calvert. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, several years ago, as, as the Chair mentioned, we uh, went out to Naval Station Guantanamo Bay. Our delegation saw some of the challenges there, heard from the leadership on how we were reducing our personnel footprint, maintaining cost, uh, maintenance costs while maintaining appropriate security. I rise because last year several of our friends on the other side seemed to suggest that the cost is too high to keep these remaining detainees, many of whom are the embodiment of evil, safely uh, behind bars in Guantanamo. Of course, we want Guantanamo run as efficiently as possible, consistent with our security requirements, and any savings we can accomplish is obviously necessary. But I'm not aware of any members who are anxious to have these terrorists transferred in their district, which is why the funding restriction has been included in this year's bill, will be dropped in conference as the case last year. There are inherent dangers in allowing enemy combatants to potentially threaten our forces by transferring them abroad. As the last administration determined, given that the current detainee population represent the most difficult and dangerous cases from among those historically detained at the facility. There is a significant reason for concern regarding 
their re-engagement in hostilities should they have the opportunity. I don't think many of our friends on the other side of the aisle want the U.S. to transfer any of the remaining terrorists, the worst of the worst, to a foreign country where they could begin threaten American citizens and our homeland security. Likewise, I doubt if our constituents would support the transfer of a terrorist monster like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to a prison or other facility here in the United States. I would therefore respectfully suggest that it doesn't make sense for this committee to close the facility there or to give a blank check to this or any other administration regarding the transfer of those remaining hardcore Guantanamo terrorists. This common sense amendment returns our Guantanamo detainee policy to what it's been, consensus congressional policy for nearly a decade. That's why I strongly support the gentleman's amendment. I yield back. Are there other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Congresswoman Rosterman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. While I have the utmost respect for my dear friend and colleague from Florida, Mr. Diaz Ballard, I also rise in opposition to the amendment. The Guantanamo Bay Detention Facility has long been a stain on America's global image. I'm glad this bill moves us closer to seeing it finally closed. This prison was set up just over 20 years ago as a temporary holding facility. Today, its continued existence serves as a recruiting tool for terrorists, emboldens repressive governments, and endangers our troops serving on foreign soil. The prison at Guantanamo has become a symbol of injustice, cruelty, and blatant disregard for the rule of law that we in this committee usually so proudly support. The cost of Guantanamo Bay is not merely to America's reputation in the world and our national security. We spend slightly more than $13 million per prisoner every year to continue to detain the 37 men that remain there today. Our justice system serves us well and has resulted in deserved con convictions for accused terrorists, and there is no reason for this symbol of lawlessness to remain. And I might add that the previous president, Donald Trump, not once included leaving Guantanamo open as language in his proposed budget in any year he was president. We should make sure that we don't do that again, and I urge a no vote on this amendment. The Biden administration has committed to making the United States a safer and more just nation by closing Guantanamo Bay, and so should we. I yield back. Are there other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? Ms. Lee. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I rise in uh, strong opposition uh, to this amendment. As chair of the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee, we see the constant damage to America's influence, prestige, and values inflicted by the continued operation of the infamous Guantanamo prison. This facility stands as a physical mockery of America's commitment to the rule of law, due process, and the rejection of torture as an acceptable interrogation technique. When we try to press other countries to uphold the rule of law, our adversaries do not hesitate to point to Guantanamo prison to paint us as hypocrites. Closing Guantanamo would send an important message around the world that the days of detaining persons indefinitely without charge or due process are over. I look forward to the day when we can finally shut the doors on this prison. I oppose this amendment, and I encourage my colleagues to do likewise. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? There's no further debate. The gentleman from Florida is recognized uh, on his amendment. Thank you very much, Close. Madam Chair. And I, you know, I, kept, I've, I keep hearing this thing about it being a recruitment tool. The, the President Guantanamo is a recruitment tool for terrorists. Uh, I may be wrong, but that wasn't there during 9-11 when they attacked the United States here on domestic soil. They didn't need a recruitment tool other than the fact that they hate what America stands for. You know what is a recruitment tool, however? Weakness. Weakness is the ultimate recruitment tool. The catastrophic withdrawal in Afghanistan, which, by the way, has also now armed with sophisticated weapons the most, the best well, and the best armed terrorist group in the history of humanity. That's a recruitment tool. Being tough on terror is not a recruitment tool. And keeping these terrorists who attack the United States off of U.S. soil to protect our national security interests, to protect the American people, has always been a bipartisan issue that this Congress has always supported. 
So I think we should use a little bit of common sense. Yes, let's stop utilizing recruitment tools, i.e. weakness, and let's stay strong, protect the American people. This is a bipartisan issue. I hope it remains bipartisan, and I ask for your support. I yield back. The U.S. did um, manage to take out Osama bin Laden. I mean, that was not a demonstration of weakness. Uh, let me, uh, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Madam Chair, I ask for a roll call vote. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Yes. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. Yes. Mr. Christ votes aye. Mr. Cuellar. Ms. Deloro. No. Ms. Deloro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Kapter. No. Ms. Kapter votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. No. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. I think you're muted. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Mr. Adderholt? Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Mr. Cuero votes aye.
Mr. Christ? Mr. Christ, can you clarify your vote? Mr. Christ? Can you clarify your vote, Mr. Christ? Yes. Mr. Christ votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members who want to, Mr. Cuellar, recognize for an amendment? Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk, and I seek unanimous consent to consider it read. Okay. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized on his amendment. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the ranking member Granger also. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairwoman uh, McCall for their uh, for their work in this. Um, uh, committee and the work and the ranking member of Calvert also on this. Um, and I want to talk about uh, one particular amendment uh, that deals with uh, school aid, impact aid. Um, this particular amendment uh, uh, affects different school districts, as you know, when we talk about impact aid. Um, Randolph Air Force Base, uh, which is, or, or should I say, the independent school district of Randolph, uh, is one of seven coterminous school district, which is a district whose boundaries are the same as the federal military installment. They're inside. There are uh, seven of them across the nation. Uh, one of them, or a couple of them are in the state of Texas. Uh, my colleague, Tony Gonzalez, uh, will have Lackland Independent School District. That's one of those school districts. Uh, Anchor Patrick in uh, Arizona also has one of those school districts. And the other ones are in Kansas and North Dakota um, and another one in the state of Texas. Uh, the Randolph Independent School District is one of those school districts that educates about 1,400 uh, kids. Uh, it includes a elementary, a middle school, high school district, uh, high school, and they have always achieved the highest academic rating uh, for all three schools. Uh, the problem is that the Department of Defense about 10 years ago demolished uh, some of the housing uh, at Randolph Air Force Base, and they never put it back again. And when they demolished the housing 10 years ago and did not do its job and put it back again, uh, that, it, that impacted about 40% of the active duty dependent children that live off the base. That is, since there was not enough housing, about 40% of those kids now live outside uh, the, the base. And because of that reason, when the Randolph Independent School District gets money, uh, gets the impact money, uh, they, they only get 60% instead of 100%. So they're disadvantaged, so they got 1,400 kids, and they're only getting 60% of the money instead of the 40%. Uh, percent. So again, this is not an earmark that I was trying to add in here, because it does have an impact on seven of the school district, and I was willing to move uh, $2.9 million, about $3 million from another account uh, that I had requested over. Uh, but uh, uh, I am willing to work with you, Madam uh, Chair, uh, to see if in conference committee we can work, uh, work this out. Uh, just to let you know, I did do my homework. I first talked to Adam Smith, uh, the chairman, and he asked me to talk to Labor H. Uh, and then Labor H uh, asked me to talk to the National Association of Federal Impacted Schools. Uh, they asked, asked me to talk to the Military Impacted Schools Association. Uh, and working with Brian Holt, our superintendent, we worked together. We came up with some language uh, that I think will address it. Uh, I know that we need to put more money in the formula, but even if we add more money to the formula, the other ones will get 100%. Uh, and my school district would get only 60%. But 
I'm willing to work with uh, the authorizers, work with the committee, and try to get this resolved in conference committee. And at the appropriate time, I will withdraw my amendment. After I hear my right. commitment. After, right. Well, it, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My commitment is to make sure that, that the independent uh, school districts across the country, those that serve uh, only um, not only military children, but also um, this also affects tribal tribal uh, educational um, support facilities, and also even gets into uh, special ed and some other other programming that uh, the counts are done accurate, that they're done right, and that the school districts get what they deserve. So you have my commitment to make sure that working with the Department of Defense military schools that we make sure we have an accurate, correct count and that the school districts receive what they're entitled to. So thank you. And I yield back, Madam Chair. I withdraw my amendment and I will announce that the Texas barbecue is ready to be served. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm an amendment at the desk. Uh, an what? amendment for Mr. Cole. I ask that the reading be dispensed with. Okay. The gentleman uh, from Oklahoma is recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I offer an amendment to prohibit the Air Force from divesting uh, so-called E-3s, better known as AWACS, aircraft several years before its replacement program uh, can actually come online. Before I do that, I want to first express my appreciation to the chair and the ranking member for working with me on report language included in the manager's amendment, which highlights the committee's concern about further degrading an already insufficient command, control, and surveillance capability in the years between divestment and replacement. I intend to withdraw this amendment for now, uh, but I want to take a moment and I want to request the committee's continued involvement as we seek additional information and ultimately reserve the right to uh, return this amendment during the conference process. I'm uh, pleased that the department is now just recently committed to procure a procurement approach, the E-7 uh, wedge tail, but it has not provided sufficient cost, schedule, or program uh, or operational risk information to satisfactorily demonstrate uh, that we be very much a numbers-driven decision and frankly underlines again uh, the, the need for additional investment uh, both this year and in years ahead. The existing EC fleet is already insufficient to meet uh, the combatant commander's needs uh, and the budget proposes frankly, uh, a divestiture that it will take at least five years to replace. It seems to me it would be much wiser to uh, divest as replacements were coming online so we didn't lose capability. Uh, frankly, uh, this uh, decision, in my view, by the Air Force poses an unacceptable risk because we will literally for years not have sufficient capability for um, uh, aerial command control and surveillance. Uh, again, I also want to emphasize when you lose the planes, you lose the crews and you lose the maintainers. They're not going to sit around for five years while we wait to bring new aircraft online. And if we find ourselves, as we may, in a conflict during that five-year period, we will be woefully short of aerial command and control capabilities. Uh, so divesting the AWACS platform, frankly, cripple, cripples a critical capability that's already in short supply. But again, um, I would uh, appreciate the chair's assurance she'll continue to work with us. If I have that assurance, I'd be more than happy to withdraw the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to um, uh, a very active and engaged uh, subcommittee member, Mr. Cole, uh, also a member of the Rules Committee, where I know you'll be tracking to make sure that I live up to my agreement here. I appreciate uh, your willingness to work on this amendment. I agree with many of the concerns that you raised. Um, the bill does have uh, $207 million for the AWACS replacement, but I hear loud and clear what you're saying about a five-year gap. This has been an issue I've had with the Department of Defense in the way that they uh, don't smoothly do transitions, they don't do parallels. It's something I've been trying to work on since uh, being ranking member and as chair of this committee uh, currently. 
So uh, you know that we do have a report in here asking the Air Force uh, to report back on this matter, but it needs to do so in a timely manner so we can make adjustments. So I look forward to working with you, Mr. Cole, and um, I thank you for at this time withdrawing the, the willingness to withdraw the amendment. Madam Chair, I yield back. I want to thank uh, the Chair and uh, look forward to working with her. And um, frankly, I think she's uh, uh, very wise in, in stressing the need to retire old platforms, but do it in a responsible way. Uh, and I, I think that, frankly, the Air Force has come up short for a variety of reasons in recent years when we run this risk. But uh, again, uh, I thank the chair very much and uh, look forward to working with her on this matter as we go forward. With that, Madam Chair, I withdraw the amendment. The gentleman withdraws the, uh, the amendment, uh, recognizing uh, further amendments. Mr. Rutherford? For what purposes does the gentleman rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. An amendment from mm -hmm. Mr. Rutherford. I ask unanimous consent to. Without objection, the reading of the, the amendment reading. is dispensed with. The gentleman is recognized on his uh, on his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. My my amendment is really simple. Uh, it prohibits the funds in this bill from being used to de decommission any littoral combat ships. This year, the Navy requested to decommission nine LCS. While I'm grateful that our bill prohibits the decommissioning of five of those ships, it is complete financial malpractice, Madam Chair, to scrap any of these ships that have barely begun their service life. They've barely begun. Among the ships the Navy is requesting to be decommissioned, the average years of service is less than four years. Four years. That's less than one quarter of their expected 25-year life cycle. Taxpayers have already spent $4.5 billion on building out the LCS class, and it's just wasteful to throw away these decades of investment. And yes, these ships have some challenges. They re they're going to require some extra investment. However, I, I would point out that the return on the investment of repairing them and allowing them to operate throughout the rest of their service life is far greater than scrapping them. Madam Chair, we're, we're actually, this committee is actually being asked to throw away a dime to save a nickel. That makes sense. For so long, we've heard about the Navy's need for a 355-ship Navy. Decommissioning these nine ships, the remaining four, uh, seems like the opposite solution to trying to grow our fleet. LCS do fill an operational need within the fleet. Many of these ships have had some very successful deployments. The USS Milwaukee, for example, deployed last winter in support of Southcom's counter-narcotics operations. Fantastic job. The USS Sioux City recently deployed the Fifth Fleet to conduct patrols in maritime security operations in their AOR. Fantastic performance. Allowing LCS to conduct these types of missions still protects American power across the globe, freeing up our larger platforms, by the way, like our destroyers, for higher-end missions. Eight of these ships are home ported in my district of Naval Station Mayport. The Freedom Class of LCS represents a significant part of the strategic laydown at Naval Base in Mayport. A steady, robust ship count at Mayport serves our nation's security, secures our nation's security, and ensures a healthy industrial base to support the Navy. It also provides for more local maintenance opportunities, allowing sailors more time to spend with their families during a maintenance availability instead of having to ship to the West Coast. While I, would, while I will withdraw this amendment today, Madam Chair, I, I do ask for your commitment to continue working on this issue so that all nine of these littoral sh combat ships can stay in service and provide the operational value that they do to the Navy. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman from Florida for his comments uh, that the Navy is not properly uh, using uh, the littoral combat ships or LCSs as they're referred to. And decommissioning all nine, in my opinion, I agree with the gentleman, would be a total waste of money. I was just at the commissioning for the Minneapolis-St. Paul up in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, I, the, the ships have functionality to them. And uh, we have a, pr uh, I was only able right now at this time uh, to have um, the, the number that I put in the bill, but I, I will c continue to work with the gentleman. I continue to work with the Navy on this. Uh, the, the first round of discussions I had with the Navy were very unsatisfactory, and they're coming around to see the seriousness of us making sure that the taxpayers' dollars that have been invested are, at a minimum, repurposed uh, in a way that, that helps with our national security. Uh, the committee uh, <laughs> included report language directing the Navy to search for missions in, in the Southern Command and Africa Command, where they have uh, at times with Coast Guard being on ships and other things, mm. done many of the, uh, the, the, the services that, that you talked about, including with drug interdiction. So uh, we're looking uh, forward to getting a satisfactory answer for the Navy, not just a no, I don't want to look at it, I want to move on, because taxpayers' dollars need to be reinvested where they can be. So I look forward it, to working with you, to working with the Navy, uh, to ensure that the LCSs are used effectively. And I thank you for withdrawing your amendment, but it's good to know I have a strong ally in my corner when talking with the Navy, so I thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong support of the gentleman's amendment and appreciate his involvement in this issue. The Navy's proposal to decommission nine littoral combat ships long before the end of their useful service lines is extremely misguided. As China continues to grow the size of their fleet, we must ensure that our Navy has the ships it needs. Like the gentleman, I am concerned about the wasting of valuable taxpayer dollars. I thank the chair for her help and interest in this issue, and I look forward to continuing this conversation as we move forward toward conference. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd, I'd first like to thank the uh, members for their kind words and support, and I look forward to working with uh, the committee chair on this. Uh, I tell you, saving these four littoral combat ships that are still uh, looking at decommissioning, I, I think, is uh, going to be very important. And I really look forward to working with you on this and anything that, uh, that, that we can do. To, uh, to make sure that we maintain a strong Navy, um, and that's that's our goal here in our national security. So thank you, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I yield back. Are there amendments, Mr. Harris? Yes. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the, the, clerk will read the amendment. An amendment from Dr. Harris, Strike Section Eight One Four Five. Dispense with the uh, reading of the amendment. Yeah, we, we read it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> it's only three, three words long. Okay, uh, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, this strikes a limitation amendment, section 8145, which is a very interestingly constructed amendment. What it does is it says that, and I'll read it, it's short. None, the section says, none of the funds appropriated or otherwise made available by this act may be used to deny leave for any member of the armed forces or civilian employee of the Department of Defense who is pregnant and requests leave to obtain an abortion or who is a spouse, partner, or significant other of a pregnant individual and requests leave to assist that individual in obtaining an abortion. Now, what's unusual is these kinds of decisions are almost always left to the services or to the command level officer staff. And as a commanding officer, I can understand that because you know what your unit needs you know, for, for something that's elective, you know, if you have an important training mission requires everyone to be there next Tuesday, you should be able to, to have everyone there next Tuesday. And if someone comes and says, well, I need to go to a medical appointment next Tuesday, you should be able to say, can you do it Wednesday or Thursday because we have an important mission on Tuesday. This amendment says you can't do that. This amendment says you must approve that leave. 
And it doesn't say you have to approve that leave if the, if the service member or civilian employee is going to get a cancer screening. It doesn't say you have to approve that leave if, they're, leave if, they're want, if they have to be, it's a spouse and they have to bring their spouse to cancer therapy. It doesn't say you have to do it if they want to go to mental health counseling. We know suicide's a very important issue in our services. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that if you have to go to a diabetes appointment with a specialist, your spouse has to go to one. It doesn't say you, can, you have to get leave for that. It picks one and only one medical procedure for which it says we're, going to, we're not going to let the forces or the commanding officers make a decision as to whether it's appropriate to do that at that particular day. And again, the example is if you have an important training mission next Tuesday, Someone says, I, I have to go for this, not for their cancer screening, but to have an abortion. You must give them leave that day. This is interfering in the military in a way that this committee shouldn't be doing. We could construct a list of all the things that we think are important, that maybe we should have this policy. Well, like I say, maybe it's cancer screenings. Maybe it's diabetes appointments. Maybe it's mental health appointments. This is not a good policy. And I don't understand why, because the argument made, well, you know, you, you can get all those other things, you know, within the military system, but for civilian employees, that's not true. We've dragged civilian employees into this. I get it. I get the politics of it. This is a bill too important for this kind of politics, and I move to strike uh, a, Section 8145, and I yield back. Ms. McCollum is recognized. Thank you. The Harris Amendment would strike a general provision. That means sailors and Marines and DOD civilians could be denied uh, access for leave for abortion. Following the leaked Supreme Court decision to ensure women have continued access to abortion services, this general provision prohibits funds from being used to deny leave to any service member or DOD employee who's pregnant and requests leave to obtain health care services, which could include abortion, which are legal and often uh, uh, attained after cases of rape or for health or life of the mother. It's an unfortunate that we're even having to consider this language guaranteeing women leave to access to health services. With the impending Supreme Court decision, service women and DOD personnel could be living in states where it will be illegal to obtain an abortion, which means a soldier, a sailor, marine, airman, or guardian may need to travel to access reproductive health care requiring them to take leave. And remember, there are certain parameters in which abortions are performed. So there is a timing issue in this when someone finds that they're pregnant and how far along in the pregnancy they are. And then getting an appointment uh, at a facility. Now, most people have conversations about leave, and I can imagine uh, you know, uh, this conversation taking place and knowing what, what is happening. And currently, these conversations take place right now. They take place in the Army and the Air Force. They have policies that do not require a unit commander pre-approval to take leave to terminate a pregnancy. It hasn't been a problem in the Air Force. It hasn't been a problem in the Army. I believe every woman serving, regardless of which branch or service that they are, whether they're uniformed or civilian, need to be guaranteed the same right for their health care. And for that reason, yes, I added language to the bill prohibiting funds from being used to deny leave, to deny a leave for women serving, women working in the Department of Defense who find themselves in need of an abortion. This amendment, if it were to be adopted, and I'm not kidding here, I'm being very serious about this, a commander could use their discretion to stop a woman from being able to uh, leave to access care. They could just deny it. Under this scenario, a commander who raped a subordinate, impregnated her, and then could prevent her from having an abortion. And I don't think that's the gentleman's intent, but that's what could happen. So let's be honest. We still have a sexual assault problem in this country, and we have one in the military. And why would we allow a commander to make such a personal health care decision from someone serving under their command? 
So folks, I think people are reasonable and they can work out timing issues. But I, I encourage everyone to vote no on this amendment. As I said, the Army and the Air Force have policies that do not require this. Why should not every single woman who's raised up their hand and taken an oath be guaranteeing the same health care right? With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Mr. Calvert. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. The provision in question, Section 8145, is unwarranted and unnecessary. The services already have policies in place to grant leave for medical purposes. Under current policy, if a service member is denied leave by their supervisor for any reason, but especially for a medical procedure, there are mechanisms in place to appeal that through the chain of command. Further, if this provision were to become law, I'm concerned that supervisors will have to ask more questions about medical leave requests than it already currently happens in practice so as to ensure that they are in compliance. The services can determine for themselves what leave policies are necessary to maintain readiness and don't need Congress micromanaging those policies. Finally, let's remember that we're trying to craft a bill that has a chance of becoming law and provisions like this are the surest way to prevent us from passing such a bill. I urge the adoption of this amendment, and I yield back. I recognize myself. Um, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. There are 26 states that are certain or very likely to ban abortion should the Supreme Court overturn or gut Roe v. Wade. These 26 states are also home to military installations, meaning that female service members who make a decision to have an abortion or the spouses, partners, or significant others of a woman who makes this decision will be forced to travel miles out of state. The gentleman from Maryland, I know of no state that is now saying that they will prohibit a cancer screening a diabetes screening, or any other illness. They're not going in that direction except for one circumstance. These women serve our country. They put their lives on the line. They defend our freedoms, including the longstanding precedent of the right to choose. They will be hostage to their geography. These women did not have a choice of where they would be stationed, however, we feel about the issue of abortion. We should deny, deny a service member who has made the decision to serve our country the ability to take leave that she is entitled to for a safe and currently legal procedure, a procedure that could easily be obtained if she were located in a state like Connecticut, North Carolina, Nevada, New Mexico, Illinois, and others which allow women the right to make their own health care decisions. And studies have shown that active duty service women have a higher rates of unintended pregnancy than those women not serving for, is for a number of reasons. They include the frequent changing of providers and challenges obtaining contraception. Service women, particularly those in training, make up a demographic at the highest risk for unintended pregnancies, single, under the age of 25, and living in a barracks. If we do not allow these women to take leave if they decide to have an abortion, they face significant financial challenges that make it difficult to support a family and can have their careers disrupted for good, uh, and also putting their health at risk. Think about this. One million children in veteran or active duty families who last year received the full child tax credit will only receive a partial child tax credit or, chi child tax credit or not receive it at all because their parents do not earn enough. How cruel to deny women to make their own medical decisions and then to fail to support them once the child is born. Now is the time to empower all women to be able to make deeply personal life decisions without politicians inserting themselves into a doctor's office. And if they frankly have the misfortune to be stationed in one of these 26 states, then the least we can do for them is to ensure that they can take leave to obtain the medical care that they need. The decision to get an abortion should be made by a woman and her family in consultation with her doctor in accordance with her own faith. This decision should not be made by the people in this room, and I urge my colleagues 
to oppose this amendment. Mr. Adderholt is recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I, I rise in support uh, of this amendment uh, that strikes the new uh, pro-abortion language that's included in this year's bill. Uh, Section 8145 uh, is a funding limitation that prevents funding from being used to deny leave requests by service members or civilians, of course, seeking to obtain an abortion. I know that uh, some of my colleagues on the other side will decry this amendment as an attack on women's health, but I would respectfully disagree. Abortion is not health care. Our nation should invest in women's health and not abortion. For that reason, I support this amendment and encourage its adoption and yield back. Ms. Lee of Nevada. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to this amendment. At a time in our country when state lawmakers are decimating abortion access and the Supreme Court is, over to, is poised to overturn the right to an abortion, our military families and women face significant barriers to care already. The fact that we are even debating this amendment that would deny service to members, uh, or deny service members access to essential health care, and I believe that access to abortion is essential health care. It's a disgrace. It's more important than ever that we ensure that service women have the time they need to access reproductive health care, because as we all know, with the impending Supreme Court decision, abortion could be banned in about half the states in this country. So any service member living in one of those states will be unable to access abortion near them. That, of course, means they'll have to travel long distance, not to mention the timing issue. We do have, this is a time-sensitive decision as well. And that, of course, requires them to take leave. And as uh, the chairwoman said, currently the Army and Air Force have these policies that do not require pre-approval to take leave. This will just simply make it open to all members. And that should be the standard. Uh, we should not have to uh, have a commander standing in the way of a woman being able to make an essential health care decision. And we know that uh, in a reasonable world, that these conversations happen, but also in a worst case world, this could be used to deny a woman access to uh, an abortion. And that's why uh, I vehemently oppose this amendment. I think this decision should be left up to a woman and her doctor, and I urge my colleagues to vote no. Ms. Lee of California. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong opposition to this amendment, which strikes language ensuring leave for service members for reproductive health services. Now, as co-chair of the Pro-Choice Caucus, we have seen that reproductive health has been and continues to be under attack. This amendment is just another attempt by Republicans to control people's bodies and is incredibly harmful. The Supreme Court is poised to overturn the right to abortion any day now, and our military families face significant barriers to care. Even today, the vast majority of counties, 89% of them, don't have a single abortion clinic. Many states have medically unnecessary requirements and waiting periods, which increases barriers to care. Access to abortion should not depend on how much money you have, someone met, or how much money one has, or where they live or where they are stationed. As members of Congress, we should be putting service members' health and safety and real life needs first. And so, uh, members, uh, men, members of the military, um, they really should have the freedom to control their own bodies. And we should support their personal decisions. Abortion is health care. I urge my colleagues to vote no against this anti-freedom for personal liberties and freedom to control one's body and make sure that every option for our service members to exercise their own personal decisions around their bodies are upheld. Ms. Frankel. Thank you, thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry to say this. But my, 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 here we go again. Supreme Court, as we know, is poised to take away the power to control our bodies and give it to politicians. 
27 states ready to ban, ban abortion. Uh, and all these states, every state in this country has military bases. You know, as a proud mom of a United States War veteran, I know the sacrifices that these brave men and women make. Uh, they, they leave their friends, they leave their families, they train hard. Uh, they have hopes, they have dreams, they are patriots. And it is especially cruel, especially cruel, to limit the freedom of those who would risk theirs for ours. You know, we all deserve the ability to make the important personal decisions that impact our health, our lives, our futures, and that includes the 1.4 million women who are in active duty. Uh, it, this amendment is wrong. It is wrong to hold our patriots captive. And I ask, what is next? This is, this is the beginning. This is not the end. What is next? Going to ban contraceptives? Going to ban gays and lesbians in the military? Madam Chair, I, I yield back. Thank the gentlewoman. Is there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? Ms. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to the Harris Amendment. Women in the U.S. military play an integral role in defending our country, compromising 15% of the active duty force and 19% of the reserve and guard. Nearly half of the approximately 9.5 million eligible beneficiaries for military health services are women. But I'm struck by a phrase that was used in this debate that we are attempting to micromanage uh, those who make decisions about leave. Micromanage? What is micromanaging is when e any one of us decides that we have the right to make the most intimate decisions that people can make, when and how to start a family. As been said, and I associate myself with the comments of my colleagues, this should be between a woman, her family, and her doctor, and her faith. Full stop. So what are we saying to these women who come to defend our country? who proudly put on the uniform. What are we saying to the women of America? We're saying we don't trust you, that we are the ones who are going to make these decisions for you. And let's think this through. I've shared with this committee my own story of having a miscarriage that needed an abortion so I did not develop a deadly infection and could continue to be a mom to the children I already had. We're going to say in this amendment, you can't have leave if you have a miscarriage and need that type of abortion care. You can't have leave if you have an ectopic pregnancy. This is an outrage, and it is extending the regressive policies that we are seeing coming from my colleagues to service women who are simply seeking the care they're entitled to. The Air Force and the Army, Army already allow this, and we need to make sure that this right is enshrined as the law of land and apply to all service members. I'm proud our bill will ensure leave for abortion care and strongly oppose this amendment to strike such a critical provision in this bill. I urge my colleagues to vote no. Ms. Lawrence. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Our laws should protect our service members, and that's what we do. We gather as members of appropriations to ensure that in our defense fund that we take care of those who take care of us. But this amendment is just another attempt to dehumanize them at a time when state lawmakers are undermining access to abortion, Roe versus Wade is hanging by a thread, our military families shouldn't face barriers to reproductive health. We must ensure that service members have access 
to leave, to obtain reproductive care when they need it. And this is about a woman having the ability to make decisions for her own body. I too repeat myself every year when I say, show me one bill that will say when a man can take Viagra. Show me one bill when a man is restricted or have to get permission to get a vasectomy. Show me one bill where the reproductive health of men are being debated in America. It should not depend on how much money you make, where you live, or where they are stay stationed in America. This amendment is an assault to our service members' dedication and sacrifice to our country. We ensured that women would be a part of the military, and here we are, again, saying we have the right to determine what you can do and your decision. They deserve better. We should do better, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, my, my understanding here is that no one would be denied the opportunity to have an abortion. No one is controlling their health care, as they call it. This simply stops us from paying for it. So I yield back. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on this amendment? Seeing none, there's no further debate. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for uh, one minute to close. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. You know, there's, there's a reason why I actually read the text. Because if this were about service members, well, why are 700,000 civilian employees of the Department of Defense included in this bill? This is not about service members. It's about making a political point, and the straw men show it. Rape, it, rape was mentioned. Rape is already allowed in the, mil in the military for abortion. It's allowed on base. That's a straw man. If you say, well, Madam Chair, you said that, you know, it might not be available in a state. Well, you know, high sp specialty cancer care is not available in some states. But we don't have a provision that says you have to offer leave if a service member or civilian employee wants specialty cancer care and has to travel out of state. No, we understand the politics. I yield back. Madam Chair. Questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment Adam is Madam Chair, not roll not. call. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support. Recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. No. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Yes. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Yeah, Clark. No. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Ms. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayot. No. Mr. Espayot votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. No. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herra Butler. Ms. Herra Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Ms. Kaptur. No. Ms. Kaptur votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. No. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow. Aye. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. No. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. 
Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Quigley votes no. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Mr. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Mr. Adderholt not recorded. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? On this vote, the uh, uh, ayes are 26, the nays are 32, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments? Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk, and I ask that it be considered as read. The you know, general as woman is recognized to speak on her amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. My colleagues, I want to take you back to the time in which we realized that disease research lacked diversity. There were many years in which, whether it was heart disease research or cancer disease research or many other kinds of research, that the only subjects were white men. But we endeavored to make sure when we realized that, that we provided additional funding and really ramped up funding that focused on diversity in that disease research. And then, for example, with heart disease, that resulted in medical experts realizing that heart attacks manifest differently in women than they do in men, and that there are different warning signs. And so, as a result, we were able to change protocols, uh, educa educate women about what to wa watch for in, in their warning signs, and help reduce the impact and death when it comes to, to heart failure and heart disease. In the same vein, bio repositories store, with the patient's consent, biological samples, like tissue and blood, that are collected during routine clinical care, including surgical procedures. The collection of cataloged samples is used to study a particular disease or a condition. In most cases, biorepositories reside in institutions that have a particular expertise in a disease area and with researchers studying that disease. Samples in biorepositories, though, are frequently supplied by one demographic, older white men. And so that's one of the factors that leads to less research into diseases in diverse populations, which exacerbates health disparities among certain populations. 
biorepositories hold tremendous promise to advance research and understanding of health and disease. For example, one of them, the Brain Bank, that is a joint project between VA, BU, and CLF at Boston University, collects brain tissue from athletes, from veterans, and others to support research into CTE. Biorepositories are frequently inaccessible to researchers outside of the host institution, however, and in addition, biorepositories frequently are not well cataloged, particularly when it comes to cataloging samples. So for this reason, I'm requesting an addition to a report language that instructs the DOD to expand funding opportunities that would increase the availability of biological samples in diverse populations and form cooperative partnerships with established civilian research efforts towards this end. What that would do, it, was allow, it would allow entities to collaborate and develop a coordinated strategy to optimize representation of diverse popu populations in their research. I know I'm encouraged by the existing efforts within the, within the defense health program that aim to better understand chronic diseases in this manner. And we've seen some hospitals like the Cleveland Clinic launch biorepositories focusing on cataloging tissue samples for underrepresented demographic populations. But clinics need support from this committee to, so they can diversify their samples. So my amendment would further these goals, making it easier and faster to complete critical research that will provide patients with more tar targeted, diverse, and high-quality care. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. And yield back. Madam Chair, I support the amendment, and I thank the author for bringing it forward. Mr. Calvert. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. I, well, I understand the intent of the amendment, and I agree that samples collected for research need to reflect the broad diversity of our population. I'm concerned that the language as drafted could open the door to DOD creating a funding pipeline to procure fetal tissue. While I know this is not explicitly stated, it's not prohibited either. So uh, I understand that General Lady is unwilling to consider edits to the language, therefore at this time I must oppose the amendment as it's currently drafted. Um, I, I just, I'm sorry, I'm just a little incredulous. This has nothing to do with fetal tissue research. I, I will add that I'm okay with fetal tissue research. I realize that, that, that there are people that are not. Uh, I certainly would be transparent about it if that, that, that was what this is about, but it isn't. <laughs> it's about diversity and making sure that we have samples that people consent to giving. You know, for example, my husband last October had surgery, and he had a hematoma that developed. This didn't happen, but he could have, if asked, give, allowed a sample of blood from the, during his surgical procedure if, if he was asked to do that. And that would go into a biorepository so it could be studied. Now, he happens to be a white man. Uh, you know, if there are, uh, but there is a need for other diverse samples to be gathered so that that same research can be done and we can come up with, with, um, with cures and medicines and all kinds of other ways to be able to make sure that we are treating the, the diverse populations that we have and not only focusing on a narrow sample uh, of biodiversity. So, mm -hmm. so really, this has nothing to do with that. And, and the language that was, what was offered to be edited also had nothing to do with fetal research. Uh, I urge the members to support diversity in research and in medical research so that, because that's proven, uh, that has been proven time and again to make sure that we can come up with, with cures and medications and a broader, uh, using broader samples that help make sure that we can take care of more people. I yield back and urge the support of the amendment. <laughs> Any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? <laughs> Ms. Herrera Butler. Just a, just a quick question and clarifying, uh, um, and I apologize if I miss this piece, but um, so it, it's only for like, uh, it would only be people who voluntarily, you know, sign a waiver, you know, as an adult, whatever. Yes, if the general, general, general yeah. would yield, the answer to that question is yes. They have to give their permission. Yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is all permission-based sample. And there's no, like, minor, um, you know, parents aren't giving no, it. It's like just adults who are saying, yes, I'll be part of a study. Let me just, yes, that's my understanding. This is adult, this is a, 
adult permission for adult samples. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, if there is no further debate on the issue, I think the general lady from Florida has closed. Uh, so the question is on the amendment offered by the general lady from Florida. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the uh, ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Okay. Uh, let me just, uh, there are two, two votes, um, one underway. How much time left on, on, the, on the? There is, uh, there's two, two minutes remaining. Two minutes, two minutes remaining on this first vote. There is a second vote, so um, I would encourage uh, please, uh, members, to go to vote and to come back as quickly as possible. We still have on this bill, on the defense bill, eight more amendments, and then we will move to Ledge Branch. So uh, if we want to try to finish up, um, let's go. Stands in recess. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, to go out on there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, don't
Thank you. Are there further amendments? Mr. Reschenthaler, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read the amendment. Madam Chair, I ask for unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. The gentleman is recognized to speak on his bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment is incredibly simple. It would just prohibit federal funding from flowing to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which, as we all know, is a Chinese Communist Party laboratory really and more than likely the origin of COVID-19. The Biden administration acknowledged that between 2009 and 2019, USAID provided a total of $1.1 million to the Wuhan Institute of Virology through the New York-based nonprofit EcoHealth Alliance. This funding was used to study bat-borne diseases, zoonotic diseases, specifically bat-borne respiratory diseases. And that included a 2015 study that used gain-of-function research. This prohibition was included in the fiscal year 2022 omnibus signed into law in March. This is just common sense that we prevent American taxpayer dollars from flowing to a lab controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. I ask for a yes vote on this amendment, and Madam Chair, I yield back. The, the, the chair has been called away for a moment, but it's my understanding that she accepts the amendment. Calvert? I'm just going to say that's a great amendment. So uh, I hope everybody agrees. I think we all know where that virus came from. Don't have to have a top secret clearance for that. Thank you. I yield back. Anyone wish to be heard on the amendment? No? Madam Chair? Madam Chair? Ms. Kapter. Yes, I would just like to rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. Uh, I happen to be very concerned about uh, uh, the, the pandemic, obviously, but also we've had so many outbreaks of avian flu and different types of uh, large flocks around our country having to be eliminated because of the strange transferences from creatures to humans. And so I want to commend the gentleman on offering this amendment, and you have my full support. We need to understand more. And I don't think uh, NIH has really an institute of virology. I think one of our problems here in our country is it's sort of fallen between the cracks, and we don't know as much as we should about the transmittance of the various uh, viruses. So can, you know, thank you for offering it, and you have my support. Let me just ask the, uh, the, tell the chairwoman I spoke on your behalf in your absence and support. I don't know if you would want to say anything else. Okay, thank you. No further debate. Uh, the gentleman need to close on. Okay, question is on the amendment um, offered by Mr. Reschenthaler. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Been into the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. This was Reschenthaler 1. Now there is Reschenthaler 2. You want to go for it? Well, uh, yes, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, my amendment number 2. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk, my amendment number 2, Madam Chair. And I would, dispense, I would ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Okay, yes, the clerk okay. will report. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, my amendment number two is, again, another very simple amendment. It would prohibit DOD funding from flowing to the New York-based nonprofit organization EcoHealth Alliance for any work that is to be performed in China. EcoHealth Alliance, which as we know is led by Peter uh, Daszak, has an incredibly troubled record of failing to report findings from federally funded research, refusing to cooperate with congressional oversight, and collaborating with the Chinese Communist Party. They did this to obstruct a thorough investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. And let me just repeat, let me just repeat that. Dr. Daszak and EcoHealth Alliance conspired with the Chinese Communist Party to cover up the origins of COVID-19 by withholding information about the research conducted at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They praised the CCP's sham World Health Organization investigation, and they parroted Chinese talking points for months, months on end uh, at the start of this pandemic. Notably, this amendment was included in the fiscal year 2022 NDAA, and it was signed into law last December. Given EcoHealth, is, EcoHealth Alliance's troubling history and Dr. Daszak's just outright lies, 
it is essential that we continue to prevent DOD funding from supporting this organization's work in China. I urge a yes vote on this amendment, and Madam Chair, with that, I yield back. Madam Chair, I am prepared to accept this amendment, which prohibits research funds uh, that are going to be somehow supported by the Chinese uh, government, unless the Secretary of Defense determines that it's in our own national security interest. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I obviously support the gentleman's agreement. This provision obviously dovetails with the gentleman's amendment regarding China's Wuhan Institute of Virology. Similar language was carried in last year's National Defense Authorization Act, which prohibited funding for work performed by EcoHealth Alliance in China on research supported by the government of China. We know from press reports, in 2018, EcoHealth was trying desperately to get a grant from the Department of Defense, specifically the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency for research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The research involved collecting viruses from bats. And as Vanity Fair notes in an article from this past March, manipulating them to infect mice with humanized lungs. Fortunately, those two of the three DARPA reviewers reportedly approved of the proposal, one objected. That one objection was enough to prevent the contract award. That's how close we had, it came to have defense dollars tied to this pandemic. As such, I urge the adoption of this amendment and yield back. Is wishing to be heard on this amendment. No further debate. The gentleman is recognized to close. No need to close. Other questions on the amendment mm -hmm. offered by Congressman Reschenthaler? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Miss mm -hmm. Lee. Ms. Lee. Thank you. California. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, will the clerk will read? Uh, Ms. Lee, amendment number Ask one. unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Uh, the gentlewoman is, is recognized uh, to speak on the amendment. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, let me thank uh, our chairwoman, uh, Betty McCollum, for the opportunity to uh, offer this amendment and for her support. Madam Chair and members, my amendment is straightforward as I have introduced it for <laughs> several, I think it's like for many years in this committee. And it has received support over the years from both sides of the aisle. It has been adopted by our full committee markups in both 21 and fiscal year 22. In fact, a few years back, it passed this committee on a bipartisan basis under a Republican majority. My amendment would sunset the overly broad 2001 AUMF eight months after the enactment of this act. That window would give Congress and the administration plenty of time to vote and debate a new AUMF. So let me be clear. The current AUMF would stay in place for eight months, eight months, which gives us plenty of time to debate and vote on a new one should the president request one. The 2001 AUMF was enacted nearly two decades ago and bears little resemblance to the threats that we face today. It has been employed by successive presidents to use force in ways well beyond the scope that Congress initially intended. Over the past 21 years, four successive presidents have used military force pursuant to the 2000 AUMF in more than seven countries against a continuously expanding list of targetable adversaries. These presidents have further identified to Congress combat-ready counterterrorism deployments to at least 14 additional countries, including that armed combat pursuant to the 2001 AUMF could arise, mind you, could arise in additional countries as well. Not only has this authorization been used to justify military action, it has also been used for the legal justification for warrantless uh, surveillance and right wiretaps here in our own country, indefinite detention practices at Gitmo, targeted killing by drones, including of American citizens, and the open-ended expansion of military operations abroad. Madam Chair, as our brave servicemen and women have been deployed to combat zones around the world, Congress has truly been missing in action. Our failure to debate and vote on these wars is a betrayal of the American people and our constitutional duty. 
Madam Chair, I know that while we may not all share a common position on what should replace the 2001 AUMF, which we need to discuss and debate, many of us do agree that the overly broad authority is a major and concerning deterioration of congressional oversight and war-making authority. And I think many of us can also agree that a robust debate and vote is necessary, long overdue, and must take place. We should note also that only 56 members, 56 members of today's House were here to cast that vote in 2001, meaning that 87 percent of our colleagues have never had a say on the authorization to use military force, and their constituents have not had a say either. Not only has Congress changed, the threat landscape has changed dramatically in the last two decades. Osama bin Laden has now been dead for more than a decade. Our forces have been completely withdrawn from Afghanistan, and yet we have a 21-year-old authorization still providing the enabling law for how we act abroad. Really, this is an abdication of Congress's constitutional responsibility, and we need to step up and do our job. It's far past time to bring almost two decades of nonstop war to an end. The forever wars, which have spanned wider and wider across the globe, have cost us approximately $8 trillion, that's $8 trillion, and claimed over 900,000 lives. It's time for us to restore the balance to the Constitution. Enough is enough. Please support this amendment. Ms. McCollum. Madam Chair, I rise in support of this amendment. As has been pointed out two decades ago, Congress passed the 2001 AUMF when our country went to war in Afghanistan. Last year, our soldiers came home. But the AMUF from uh, 2001 was not only used for Afghanistan, it was also used for actions in Syria, Yemen, Yemen the Philippines, and countries in Africa, situations which quite often I did not support. So we don't need to rely on an outdated uh, open-ended authorization in Afghanistan for the security challenges we face. I thank the gentlewoman for offering this amendment, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I rise in opposition to the amendment, which would repeal the legal authority used by our armed forces in the fight against al-Qaeda and ISIS. While I appreciate the principled position of the sponsor of this amendment, I believe it's deeply misguided and contrary to the national security interests of the United States. Despite the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and the tragic fall that the, the, the country to the Taliban, the 2001 authorization for use of military force remains a vital authority to the President, the Department of Defense, and our men and women in uniform. As we recall, it authorizes the U.S. to employ military force against al-Qaeda, the murderous terrorists that planned and committed a 9-11 attack, as well as forces associated with al-Qaeda such as Islamic State, which otherwise known as ISIS, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and Al-Shabaab in East Africa. It's also a critical legal basis for the military detention at the facility at Guantanamo Bay. Madam Chair, I can think of few actions that are more counterproductive than to repeal this critical counterterrorism authority without Congress first having passed a replacement that will be signed into law. According to the latest annual threat assessment by the Director of National Intelligence, al-Qaeda and ISIS continue to plot terrorist attacks against the United States, not just the United States, but our allies, including to varying degrees in the United States, and seek to exacerbate the instability in regions such as Africa and the Middle East. This amendment pr presumes that 240 days is sufficient to pass a new AUMF, uh, but we can't risk that. Repeal and replace needs to be simultaneous. Most of us would agree that it would be good to have an updated AUMF that aligns with the threats of today and helps reaffirm Congress' traditional role in war powers. As we all know, however, there continues to be a lack of consensus on the details and no imminent prospect for reaching a consensus on these difficult legal matters. To unilaterally repeal the principled legal authority on which the Department of Defense relies carry out global counterterrorism operations would be a grave mistake and seriously detrimental to our national security. I strongly urge the defeat of this amendment. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There is no further debate. The gentlewoman from California is recognized 
on the amendment to close. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, there is very little debate on this resolution almost 21 years ago, and so year after year, I have introduced legislation to sunset the AUMF. Congress cannot continue to abdicate its constitutional responsibility. We can begin to address this by repealing the 2001 AUMF after a period of eight months. Congress should be able to do its job within eight months. This authorization remains in place for eight months. So let's ask the tough questions, yes, about the direction and duration of our forever wars. We owe it to our constituents and the country, though, to bring this AUMF to a conclusion and to begin this debate based on the current threats. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment and do away with this blank check for endless war. Thank you again, and I yield. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Ms. Lee, do you have an additional amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, uh, I have an amendment at the desk. It's uh, Lee Amendment Number Two. Okay, the clerk will read. Uh, Ms. Lee, Amendment I ask Number for unanimous Two. Unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. The gentlewoman is recognized to speak on her amendment. Madam Chair, this amendment um, is very simple. It would terminate the outdated but yet still dangerous 2002 authorization for the use of military force. I say outdated because the 2002 AUMF no longer serves any operational purpose uh, for the United States. U.S. military deployments and operations carried out under the 2002 AUMF, dubbed Operation Iraqi Freedom, officially concluded in 2011, officially. And I say dangerous because the 2002 contained no sunset provisions. Leaving this outdated and unnecessary authorization on the books allows any president to utilize it for military action that Congress never intended to authorize. This committee adopted the same amendment last year by voice vote, and the full House has already voted three times to repeal this AUMF, most recently in June of last year when the House adopted this same language by a vote of 268 to 161. We can't afford to leave outdated AUMFs on the books indefinitely. It is far past time for Congress to finally do our constitutional job and vote on matters of war and peace. Ms. McCollum. Madam Chair, I rise in strong, very strong support of this amendment, which repeals the uh, 2002 AUMF for the Iraq War. This AMUF, as the other one, uh, are authorizations that should have been repealed. Uh, the war authorized through this AUMF ended, it ended in 2011, when President Obama withdrew uh, 43,000 43, troops from Iraq. The United States currently has no obligations militarily that rely on this AUMF. U.S. service members in Iraq are there today and they are there at the invitation of the Iraqi government to train and equip the Iraqis and the Kurds to fight ISIS. I oppose the war in Iraq, but whether you voted for it in uh, 2002, this AMUF has outlived its usefulness and it should be repealed. And I thank the gentlewoman from offering the amendment. And Madam Chair, I yield back to you. Mr. Calvert. I rise in opposition to the amendment, which repeals the 2002 authorization for use of military force. Madam Chair, the House has debated and voted on this proposal several times in recent years, so I'll be very brief. Although the threat posed by Saddam Hussein's regime was the initial focus of this act, the United States has relied on the 2002 AUMF for continuing military operation against ISIS and other terrorist threats in Iraq, including Iran-backed militias. This authority is directly relevant to those Iranian-backed forces because they are not associated with either al-Qaeda or ISIS, and thus not covered by the 2001 AUMF. This authority was used to uh, uh, remove Mr. Soleimani from the planet, who was responsible for many U.S. deaths over the years. So it was used quite recently. As the latest threat report to the Director of National Intelligence points out, Iran and militant allies will take advantage of weak governance to continue to plot terrorist attacks against the United States person or interests. These proxies include Iraqi Shia militias, which continue to be the primary threat to the United States military and other personnel in Iraq. Iranian-supported groups in Iraq have, uh, have 
continued their provo provocations under President Biden, including an upsurge of attacks this spring with drones and rocket fire. The 2002 AUMF helps protect our servicemen and women and other American personnel in Iraq and should not be repealed without being simultaneously replaced by an updated authority. Repealing 2002 AUMF with no replacement would only embolden Iran and support its ambitions in Iraq and undercut the efforts of our military to safeguard our national security. I therefore oppose the amendment and yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There is no further debate. The gentlewoman from California is recognized on the amendment to close. Thank you very much. I want to thank our chair, um, Betty McCollum, for her support. And uh, I just want to remind members that uh, the 2002 authorization was based on the notion that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was the basis upon which this Congress voted for that. There were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And even saying that, uh, it officially ended the war in 2011. So Congress should assert, we should assert our Article I responsibility to define when and how our country goes to war. I ask for an aye vote. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. Are there further am amendments? Uh, Mr. Adderholt? Uh, the clerk will read. Amendment from Mr. Adderholt at the appropriate place. The gentleman uh, is recognized to speak on his amendment. This uh, amendment is, uh, will basically just ensure that politics are not used as a criterion when determining geographic reassignments for our military or civilian personnel. In particular, this amendment prohibits military services from reassigning personnel from one U.S. state, locality, or territory to another that is based on policies, statutes, or laws of a locale where the personnel may be stationed at the time. Last month, a draft guidance document was leaked, which would provide additional circumstances that entitle a soldier to a so-called compassionate reassignment. Re reportedly, soldiers could request Quest to move if, they, if they're in a state and they feel that any kind of state or local laws discriminate against them based on their gender, sex, religion, race, or pregnancy. Military commanders are charged with ensuring good order and discipline among the troops. Furthermore, to be an effective fighting force, commanders must build and maintain strong unit cohesion. Allowing a soldier to seek a transfer to a specific state based upon a political ideology fundamentally under, undermines the good order and discipline and erodes the commander's ability to maintain unit cohesion, both of which make the military less lethal and less effective. This may sound, what uh, this policy may sound innocuous, but allowing military personnel to pick and choose which states they're stationed and based on the, and based solely on the laws of that state, starts us down a very dangerous path. This amendment seeks to prevent the polarization and the division and the disrupting of our military. Our nation's military should not be divided geographically based on ideology, but instead should be united in service to our nation. The shared sense of purpose and the belonging ensures that the integration of a diverse population for the mutual defense of our entire nation. And I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. We need to support our troops and their families who serve alongside them, especially those with special needs and special circumstances. Each of the services has long-standing programs that allow military members to be reassigned or temporarily deferred from an assignment if they have a family hardship. The Army calls their program Compassionate Consignments. The other services call this program Humanitarian Assignments. 
When a military member and is, uh, has dependents with special needs, they can apply and enroll in the Exceptional Family Member Program. The overall goal is to help families and the service member uh, be at assigned duty locations that will support their family's medical, psychological, or other special needs, which can include health care, mental health, or even at times special education services. This amendment could have an extreme de detrimental effect to force the service member to choose between service to country or duty to family. We shouldn't take away tools of commanders and the services to improve morale within the ranks, enhance retention, and support the families that serve alongside them. I believe that this is a, a poor, poorly drafted amendment, and I urge a no vote. Madam Chair, I yield back to you. Albert. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. Uh, earlier this year, the press reported on a leaked Army memo that the gentleman mentioned that showed the service is considering a policy that would allow for soldiers to request relocation if they're concerned that the state or local laws discriminate against them based on gender, sexual orientation, religion, race, or pregnancy. I recognize the use of compassionate reassignment as it currently exists, especially in the case of a family emergency. However, allowing soldiers, in effect, to determine their duty station based on the criteria reported in the memo involves the Army in inherently political decision. In a functioning democracy, laws are based on legislation approved by elected political leaders, and we expect our military to respect and adhere to those laws, whether they are federal, state, or local laws. Our senior military leaders understand that, have repeatedly stressed the need for the military to remain apolitical. Yet a policy like this, when reported, would set a dangerous precedent by upending, upending the apolitical nature of the military and involving it in political decisions. It would also threaten to balkanize our military along ideological lines. To preclude this possibility, we must adopt the gentleman's amendment and send a message that we will not tolerate the, politiz the politicization, the politicalization, excuse me, of our military. I yield back. Are there other members who wishing to be heard on the amendment? Ms. Frankel. <clears throat> My, my, my. Here we go again, folks. I wonder what this amendment's about. The women of this country are about to be hit by a tsunami of laws that dismantle their right to reproductive freedom, their right to be in charge of their futures and their health, and gives it to politicians. And about 27 states are about to close the door on abortion. So let me just say this, and I'm sort of repeating myself from before, which is, you know, the, the, both the men and the women who go to service in the military, they are great patriots. They're willing to risk their lives for us. They're willing to give up their freedom for us. They leave their families, their friends uh, for us. And they have hopes and they have dreams and aspirations to protect this country. And we should not deprive them of their freedom. And I'll leave it at that. I oppose this amendment, and I yield back. Are there any other? Mr. Garcia. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I'm seeing a dangerous trend with, uh, I think, Congress and this body in, in particular maybe overreaching its scope. Uh, we're, we're getting to the point where we're trying to tell the military how to do its job rather than provide the resources to do the job. Uh, we're getting very prescriptive and limiting, and in, in some cases, artificially handcuffing how the military leaders can employ and move their troops. Uh, if the argument is that we are, we, we have some of our personnel who don't have adequate uh, access to resources, uh, such as medical care or specialty health care, uh, this body should should focus on adding infrastructure and facilities around these key bases that are less popular or deemed to be inadequate for special needs families uh, and solve that problem for all of our military families because you don't know when you get orders to a base whether or not you're going to have a child that has a rare disease that needs specialty care. So we should try to level set that for all of our bases rather than removing 
the flexibility from the military commanders and, and the detailers. A good detailer will look at the situation that a family has. If they have a, a particular medical condition within the family, they will bend over backwards to get that family to the adequate facilities and to the adequate base to, uh, to, to meet that, uh, that, that need, that health care need. Uh, so I think this is us overreaching. I think this is us focusing on the wrong problem. We should be focusing on infrastructure around all of our bases so that the quality of life and the quality of care for all of our service members is adequate uh, rather than artificially handcuffing our military leaders and limiting their options on how they deploy their troops and employ their troops and move their troops around the nation. I yield back. Ms. Mang. I rise in strong opposition to Mr. Adderholt's amendment. Our troops and their families who serve alongside them deserve our full support no matter the circumstances. That supporting our troops also means supporting their families. As Chair McCollum mentioned, each of the services has long-standing programs that already allow military members to be reassigned or temporarily deferred from an assignment if they have a family hardship. This type of amendment does precisely what Mr. Garcia mentions, overreach. There should be no exception when a member of our military has dependents, family members, that are affected by the dozens of new state laws restricting rights like reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights. It's overreaching. And that's why I submitted and the chair included my report language request supporting the actions already taken by the Air Force to do just that. There should be policies department-wide to support our troops and their families who are affected by these outrageous new laws popping, out, popping up throughout the country. This amendment does nothing but strike these good policies and forces a service member who is serving our country to have to choose between service to our country or duty to family. I urge a no vote. Are there other members who wish to be heard on this amendment? If there's no further debate, uh, then the- uh, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. Who, who seeks recognition? Mr. Palazzo, Mr. Palazzo I'm so sorry. Uh, Congressman, no, no I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there, um, but thank you for recognizing me, Madam Chair. The memo singling that the service was considering allowing service members to request what state they would like to be stationed in based on whether that state has restrictive abortion or LGBT laws is outrageous to say the best. Our leaders at the Department of Defense are not politicians and should be focused on training our troops to face our growing list of adversaries, not bowing down to woke liberal policies. My home state of Mississippi has many military installations that play a critical role in our nation's national security. Mississippi is also a champion for pro-life. Laws that are overwhelmingly supported and voted on by the citizens of my state. Allowing service members to choose where they are stationed based on their personal beliefs will directly weaken our national security. Let's remember, our troops are charged with and have taken an oath to defend the United States of America. And that means all of the United States, not just the ones that have bent their knee to the woke left. I support the Adderholt Amendment and thank the gentleman for leading the charge on this disastrous policy. And I yield back. Thank you. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? There is no further debate. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized to close. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. I just want to reiterate the importance of maintaining unit cohesion. Our military personnel pledge an oath to defend the United States, not just the states which they choose to live in. And I ask for a yes vote as an amendment, and I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Alabama. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Aye. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not Please adopted. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support. A recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Yes. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. 
Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert? Aye. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter? Yes. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright? Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case? Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark? Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole? Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ? Mr. Oh. Mr. Chris votes no. Mr. Cuellar? Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. DeLauro? No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat? No. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman? Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel? Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia? Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger? Aye. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder? Aye. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris? Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. No. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. Yes. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. Yes. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Mrs. Let Ms. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. No. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? The clerk will tally. <clears throat> On this vote, the yeas are 26 and the nays are 32, and the amendment is not adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. Garcia? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will, uh, the clerk will read the amendment. Madam Chair, woman, I ask that the uh, reading be dispensed with. Okay, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Chair, this uh, amendment is pretty straightforward. It's a continuation of our uh, shared commitment uh, within this body to uh, make sure that we are providing the, the adequate resources to our active duty troops and their families. Uh, there's not a, a single weapon system in our inventory or our, our arsenal that is as important as, as our troops and their families. If we don't have the support of the families, uh, we will have significant uh, challenges with not only recruitment but retaining uh, our active duty members, and this is n no more than the case than, than, than with our junior enlisted folks. Uh, right now, uh, our enlisted uh, personnel start uh, with a meager uh, $20,000 a year as, this, as their base pay. Uh, this amendment simply makes it a requirement for the DOD by, by the uh, September of 2023 
to get to a minimum base salary of $31,200 uh, for all active duty uh, military members. Uh, there are arguments out there that say this is just the base salary and that there are also housing allowance, that there are subsistence uh, uh, allowances out there. The, the bottom line is that the sum of these parts don't add up to a living wage for many of our troops uh, who are literally below the poverty line and many of them are on food stamps. This was a problem when I was on active duty uh, in the 2000 uh, to 2010 period. About a third of my sailors were on food stamps uh, this has been aggravated by the inflationary uh, rates that we're seeing now in the, in the current times. Uh, the 4.6 percent pay raise is something that many members will stand up and tout. They'll say, hey, we can take that home to our constituents, and uh, they behave as if that's a good thing. Uh, under normal circumstances, I would say that's woefully insufficient. That equates to about $100 a month pay raise for our junior enlisted personnel. That is meager. Uh, we're not talking about the officer ranks. We're not talking about the senior enlisted. We're talking about the junior enlisted. When you aggravate that with 8.5% inflation rates, uh, we are driving our troops literally into poverty uh, and deeper into debt to the point where they can't afford to serve in our military. We have an all-voluntary force, and we need to incentivize our active duty member to stay on the books and hopefully recruit uh, talent uh, as, our, as our domains and, and the fights that we're fighting get more complex and more technologically advanced. Uh, so I urge support of this amendment. This is, a, again, a simple increase to ensure that all uh, enlisted are uh, at or above $31,200 before September of 2023. This is a doable due. Uh, this is an affordable thing. We can find offsets within several buckets of money, uh, and we should prioritize our personnel wel welfare uh, just as much as we do any other weapon system that we're talking about today. I yield back. Ms. McCollum. Thank you. I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. And I know that the gentleman's amendment, and I sincerely mean this, is well-intentioned. Uh, and I agree with what's happened with inflation, the 4.6% increase is not enough. And we've been working throughout this bill for help for daycare, for housing. We've, we've got increases um, moved on. We've been um, talking about what we can do better, better for health care, very concerned about what the Department of Defense has been doing with um, shutting down billets, health care billets in some areas and, and you know, putting a hardship on families uh, to get to a pediatrician's office or just do routine uh, health care because they're just put into um, the, the system where the base is located. Uh, Mr. Kilmer and others, and, and Mr. Carter, at every single hearing we've had, we have had very serious conversations about how this has to be addressed, and we've had them with the Pentagon. And, um, you know, if I had more money in this budget, that would be fine. Well, let's talk about what this amendment is. It creates an $18 billion, $18 billion shortfall in this bill. No offsets offered. I've already been told that there's not enough money in here. You heard Mr. Calvert and I, who get along great. That's more money for, for uh, the arrow. Where is this going to come from? Well, I'll tell you where it would come from, because there's no offset. And if the gentleman wants to bring this to a floor with an offset, then let's have the discussion that way. This would force the services to slash not only pay, yes, pay, housing, subsidy allowances in order to cover the cost. The uh, services uh, uh, would uh, seek reprogramming funds from other accounts to address the shortfall. It would damage our readiness, modernization, and procurement efforts. It would put every program at risk. It would be like doing an across-the-board cut if, if, if that was the, the clean way uh, that, that we often see amendments on the floor to do it. At a time when China is modernizing and we see capa uh, capability gaps in our own systems, as, as everybody, especially on the other side of the aisle, has, has uh, put forward, military personal accounts, the military personnel accounts, would be cannibalized in order to make this happen. And I agree. I wish this was a bigger pay raise for, for the troops. Basic uh, needs uh, you know, need to be uh, increased. But this bill also has in it, folks, um, an additional $600 million in military pay to buy down rising costs. Now, the gentleman knows that we support basic allowance for housing and basic allowance for, for, subs, you know, for um, subsidence. But we need to do more. 
and we have been talking as a committee how to do more. You and I had this conversation uh, a year ago, and we put more in it. But I need to balance the budget at the end of the day, folks. And that's what I did. I balanced the budget. So just to offer this amendment with no offsets, no one knows what they're voting for, and no one knows what the outcome will be. And I don't think that that's the gentleman's intention, or, or, and I certainly know it's not my intention not to do something. So I don't question anybody's support in this room for our troops and their families. I don't. But the bill in front of us has a 4.2% increase in the basic housing allowance. We've talked about the pay allowance. It has a 3.2% increase for the basic uh, allowance for uh, subsistence. We need to do better, but I need to offset it. So help me get to conference with the Senate and get more money into those accounts. But to just do it this way, I don't know how it's all going to fall out. But I think we're all going to be disappointed in what it could look like at the end, especially if it goes back into those accounts that affect pay and affect some of the other things that we need to give our soldiers for readiness. We need to do more, we need to do better, but we need to balance the budget. And there's no offset in here, and no one knows how this is going to turn out. So at this time, I would really urge people to not support this amendment and support all of us working together to do better by our servicemen and the women in a transparent way and how we know the budgeting is going to look at the end of the day. With that, I yield back. Mr. Calvert. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I thank the gentleman for offering this amendment to raise the issue of how this economy is negatively impacting our service members and their families. In our home state of California, gas, food, other daily costs are at historic race, uh, rates right now. So I support the pay increases. We all do, included in this bill. I believe, as the chair said, we need to do more to ensure that our service members and their families earn a sufficient income, especially in areas like California, which has an extreme high cost of living. I look forward to working with the chair and with the gentleman on this important issue and to, to solve this problem. With that, I yield back. Are there other members who wish to speak? I saw Mr. Rushenthaler. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Yes. Gonzalez. Gonzalez, I apologize. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, when I joined the Navy, uh, I came in as an E-1, and I made $800 a month. Uh, with today's current inflation and taxes, that's about what a house staffer takes home here in D.C. And it's criminal. It's criminal that we treat these enlisted sailors this way. Having to be on food stamps, that hasn't changed. And oh, by the way, that $800 a month, I had to raise a family. I had a young family as well. You know, I, I appreciate the gentleman from California introducing this amendment. I think it's an extremely serious topic that we all must have. Here we are asking our men and women to go fight our nation's wars throughout dangerous, and, and not, even, not even abroad. I mean, just some of the dangers here in, 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 in CONUS, and, and yet we're paying them below minimum wage? I mean, it's absolutely criminal that we have not had a broader discussion on this amendment, and uh, I strongly urge a, a yes vote. I yield back. Mr. Amaday. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, I don't know if I've ever risen in, in, in opposition to, to the subcommittee chairwoman, and I don't envy your job. And I hear the frustration in your voice and share it. So I don't think any of this boils down to you're wrong and I'm right or any of that other sort of stuff. But I've also been around long enough, and many of you have been around much longer to know that this dilemma in this budget and how we take care of those entry-level people in this organization, forget for a minute that it's <clears throat> the profession of arms, and how we take care of those people and what message that sends. And most of the time, Democrats and Republicans, people who are serving and have served, have kind of come down with, we got to balance the budget and we got to do this and that and the other sort of stuff. I get that. And that will continue. I would only say that once in a while, once in a while, this Congress needs to lead. And they need to lead those folks in the Department of Defense 
who have other multiple priorities and it's competing tough stuff. But having said that, once in a while, the little folks need to win one, not for Democrats and Republicans, but because we care about our entry level folks in all professions and especially in the profession of arms and in the economic times that we're in. Yeah, we're going to have to find a pay for at some point in time, some way, and the balance, the budget still got to be balanced. I get all that. But if we don't send an occasional signal to those entry level folks in all branches that, hey, you get to play once in a very rare while also, then, Madam Chair, who will? And so, tough choice, I get that. I just hope that we've decided that for those people that are doing those jobs, this is a good time to send a message to those folks higher up and go, guess what? Wish we had more money, we don't. We gotta make these books balance somehow, but we're gonna make them balance for the folks that are the entry level folks in all services. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Ms. Kaptur. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I rise to uh, uh, oppose the amendment. And I would like to yield uh, my time to the chair. I think you have to remain standing. Yeah. You have to, you have to remain standing, Marcy. So I'm all about sending a message to the Pentagon. I'm with you. We passed this amendment. I have my allocation. And we cut. And so sometimes when I, uh, and I still go door knocking, and people say, you know, I don't want to spend money on this program, and I don't want to spend money on that program. And I go, you know, cut it, cut it, cut it. And I'll say, name one program that's important to you, because these other programs are important to other people, that you're willing to take a haircut on. And sometimes they'd come up with one, and sometimes they wouldn't. So I would like to ask, and I, you know, some of you know I'm a former social studies teacher, but I'm not really going to call on anybody except for the, the author. I'm not going to put people on the spot. But this is not a message if this passes. This is reality. So Mr. Gonzalez, we, uh, excuse me, Garcia, Mr. G uh, I'm only going to call on the people that spoke. So Mr. Gonzalez, get your, get, get your yours ready too, and you too, Mr. Amade. I won't ask you to give me $18 billion, because that's what I'm going to have to cut. Give me $1 billion right now that, you, that I'm going to go back and cut. That's not OK. That's, that's, that's who you are. That, 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 that's, so you didn't offer an offset. You could have. Is that not true? Would the gentleman yield? I mean, you offered me no offsets. Obviously, you have ideas of where we could cut. Mr. Mr. Uh, Gonzalez, what, would you yield? What, what would you? What? And climate change, yeah, we get that. We already tried to do that for the Aero program, but what would you cut? Are you telling me there is nothing in this proposed package that is there, everything in this proposed package is more important than ensuring our enlisted sailors, soldiers, sailors, and airmen don't make minimum wage? That's what I'm hearing from the gentleman. gentleman. Well, and thank you for claiming my time back. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I don't get to choose the dollar amount. This is a dollar amount I've been given. Madam Chair, if the if the if, if the, the, the gentleman would, would like yield. to be recognized, I would yield to him. I, I I don't know where this 18 billion dollar number you're you're speaking of comes from. Uh, when you when you look at the the total of uh, personnel in the E1 through E3 ranks, that's 280 thousand people. Uh, and their total personnel budget, uh, if, you, if you look at just a, a nominal pay grade. Recla reclaiming my time. I asked the staff when I saw this amendment, I asked the staff because I want to know how much it cost, because I was going to see what we could do. And, and the and staff I, and I here, the professional that, staff here, I, it's my, uh, Ms. Captor's giving me the time. I'm going to take the time back because it's going to be gone. I have to go back, and I have to, that's what the staff has told me. You know, our, 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 staff, our staff functions in, in, in a nonpartisan way. I've already been told by, by the minority there's not enough money in here. People are asking for, you know, more, more funding for other things in here. And this is important. But if this amendment were to pass, I have to go back, 
before we go to the floor, and I have to cut $18 billion. So that's why I'm not supporting, supporting this amendment, and I thank the gentlewoman for yielding me the time. <laughs> Um, I'm going to yield myself. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rushenthaler, you go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to uh, yield to my colleague, Mike Garcia. I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Uh, Madam Chair, the, the, the total uh, cost footprint of the E1 through E3 is estimated to be a, itself and in, in its entirety less than $8 billion. So I don't know where this $18 billion comes from. Uh, the math that we did uh, with my staff, and I, I agree, we need to do a deep dive and put f more finite numbers behind this so we can understand the scope of this challenge. I think this is a solvable problem. I don't think this is, this is something that we can't figure out with, within our collective group here. Of all the things we do, this, should, this is certainly not the hardest thing we, sh we, we are looking at uh, trying to do. Uh, it is between a $1.5 billion and a $2.5 uh, uh, $2 billion footprint that we're looking at enacting here. Uh, it's certainly not in the coordinate system of $18 billion. Uh, the offsets that I've proposed in the past have been to look at the office, uh, senior officer ranks and decrement their pay increase uh, such that they're not, in this case, getting a 4.6 percent increase but getting something on the order of 1.5 to 2 percent. And one officer's uh, pay increase is roughly anywhere from three to five enlisted personnel's uh, pay increase in a given year. So there are offsets within the existing footprint that I think are achievable. But the bigger message here is that we, we've got to prioritize this. I hear a lot of things like we've been working on this. Uh, we've had serious conversations. I haven't seen us actually working on this. We haven't had those serious conversations. We haven't done the deep dives to find the offsets to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, and so I think we can do better, and I think within this group we can collectively find an offset. I can, I certainly can, and we can tee those up. Uh, but, uh, and, and I appreciate the chairwoman's uh, uh, stewardship of balancing the budget. I think that's something that we all, all agree with, and I, I'm a fiscal hawk myself, but uh, it can't come at the expense of our personnel. We can't decide to not solve problems at the, at the risk of not supporting and paying our personnel above uh, minimum wage and effectively poverty lines at the national level. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I, I yield myself some time to say a, a, a couple of things. One, it's my understanding uh, that it's the Pentagon that gave us the number. We didn't just pull it out of a hat or go someplace and say, whoa, I think it ought to be $18 billion no. this year. The Pentagon. And the other point I would make to the gentleman is if you want to move forward on this, cut, do an amendment on the floor when the bill comes up with offsets so that you can do the deep dive. Now, I want to make a comment about offsets. And honestly, disingenuous. I've been struggling. Others have been struggling. Mr. Bishop has been struggling in the last several weeks to extend the waivers for the school lunch program for children in this country for the summer months. It expires, the waiver expires on June 30th. The demand, the demand from the other side of the aisle has been no waivers without an offset. No waivers without an offset. Is not feeding children in this country something that is worthwhile doing? So let's not have a set of standards for one group and another set of standards for others. My suggestion is, and you ought to think about this, as to whether or not you would like to offer this amendment, do it on the floor of the House, and come up with offsets. The Pentagon said $18 billion. We don't have a way to get to $18 billion a billion dollars without cannibalizing, to use the chair's word, on this bill. And I might just add, we found offsets for the, the waivers for the kids, and my hope is that within the next two days we are going to be able to pass that so our youngsters this summer can be able to have a lunch program. Let's not, let, let's not talk out of both sides of our mouth. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on this amendment? No further to debate. Gentleman is recognized to close. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate the passion and the emotion behind this. I share it. 
I, I think we as a nation have to do the right thing for our, for our troops, especially our junior enlisted, uh, but also our nation's security. This is the prime ingredient to our nation's security. The way we treat our active duty military will determine the trajectory of our nation's security. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you have these types of conversation and in parallel uh, propose a top line that is woefully insufficient to, to keep pace with our, with our China threat, uh, we're on a, on, a, on a path for, for failure uh, in, in the near future here. Uh, so I, I, I'm reluctant to offer an offset uh, because, frankly, the top line is too low. Uh, what I would ask is that as we go to conference, uh, we, we, we look at how we can prioritize military service member pay, active duty, junior enlisted, so that if there are additional funds allocated to this bill through conference, that this isn't treated as an oh, by the way, and we end up having this conversation 12 months from now and act like we didn't have it 12 months ago, like we are right now. Uh, so that's what I would ask. I, it, it, this is more than messaging. I think we need a forcing function. We are going to have a massive retention and recruiting problem if we don't solve this uh, within the next, uh, I would call it, six months. Okay? And I don't think our commanders realize that. I don't think the Secretary of Defense and the, and the respective branches understand this problem uh, that's coming here very shortly, especially with the political climate within our military. I yield back. I, I strongly recommend support of this. Question is uh, on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Aye. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Yes. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Yes. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. No. Mr. Case votes no. Votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. Deloro. No. Ms. Deloro votes no. Mr. diaz Blart. Mr. diaz Blart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Aye. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. Aye. Mr. Harder votes aye. Dr. Harris. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. No. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow. Aye. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. McCollum votes no. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roy Allard. Ms. Roy Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. No. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. No. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Aye. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change? Mr. Not You're not recorded at the moment. Dr. Harris votes aye. Any member wish to record their vote or change the vote? 
Not at the moment, not, not recorded. Mr. Ryan votes aye. The clerk will tally. I'm sorry, Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mr. Adderholt? Mr. Adderholt, Adderholt votes aye. On this vote, the yeas are 28 and the nays are 29. The amendment is not adopted. Are there any further amendments? Mr. Okay. Klein. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read. I move that it be uh, considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to speak on this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise to offer this amendment to draw attention to an issue that's being discussed by members of the National Guard in my district and by some of our nation's greatest military heroes, including surviving participants in the D-Day invasion of Normandy in 1944. Uh, the amendment would prohibit funds from being used by the Army to remove from usage the badge or insignia of the 29th Infantry Division of the Army National Guard, as the Congressional Naming Commission considering the logo makes such a recommendation. Um, as you may know, the 29th Infantry Division was formed in 1917, and since then it's had a storied existence. First deployed to France during World War I, the division later played a crucial role in the Normandy landings during World War II. The division, which is currently made up of units from Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, and West Virginia, uh, states which formerly were opposing forces, and its badge was created w uh, for the purpose of reconciling a divided nation. Uh, the division's iconic patch designer, Major General James Ulio, designed the badge around the yin-yang symbol, which is a common figure in Asian traditions that signifies an embrace of opposing forces. As Adjutant General, Ulio had overall responsibility for the classification and assignment of soldiers in the Army, where he led the way for racial integration in the Army by ordering the end of racial segregation in recreational facilities and on military transportation on all Army posts. According to retired Chief Warrant Officer Al Barnes, the Virginia National Guard Command historian, Major General Ulio understood the significance of the 29th and recognized that it was different from other Army divisions because it comprised units from both sides the Mason-Dixon line, and he wanted a patch that would properly signify this coming together of soldiers from all backgrounds and histories. And for over 100 years, men and women have proudly worn the badge in war, from France to Bosnia and Kosovo, and yes, most recently, Afghanistan and Iraq. And this includes retired Major General Linda Singh, the former Adjutant General of the Maryland National Guard, and the first African American and the first woman to head the Guard, who believes that the 29th Division patch does not belong in the same category as other military assets under consideration by the Commission. And recently she stated in a Washington Post article, definitely understand the angst in and around the meaning of different logos, patches, and names, but the 29th logo is different. It has always been about the power of bringing together the North and the South. It's a symbol of unity, one of the highest American values. To me, it's exactly the kind of insignia we should be lifting up right now. I agree with Major General Singh, and I hope the Commission will retain this important symbol of unity. And with that, I ask unanimous consent to withdraw my amendment. Ms. McCollum. Madam Chair, um, I thank the gentleman for withdrawing the amendment. But I do want to uh, reiterate what the gentleman said. The soldiers in this unit performed heroic acts in World War II, World War I, and, and moving forward. But the Commission has been looking and receiving in-depth briefings on the history of the patch 
and the design following research performed by its historian, which includes visits to the Museum of the Maryland National Guard in Baltimore, the D-Day Memorial at Bedford, uh, Virginia, the Museum of Virginia National Guard, and more. The Commission's public affairs officers had opportunity and engagement in France earlier this year with a variety of voices. They are making this decision and taking it very, very seriously. So I really appreciate the gentleman letting the Commission move forward. So far, I, I'm a hard grader. I'm giving them a B plus for, for what they've done, but we're, we're waiting to see how they, they move forward. So I thank the gentleman for bringing this uh, to our attention. And as a social studies teacher, it's always good to share a history lesson. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, like <laughs> Are there any further amendments? Uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Madam Chair, amendment at the desk. I ask it be considered as read. Two, the gentleman is recognized to speak on his amendment. Madam Chair, this amendment, which I intend to withdraw, adds 11 V-22 aircraft for the Navy and Marine Corps. First, I'd like to thank Ranking Members Granger and Calvert for their support for this program, as well as, as well as the Chair for her support in conference in fiscal year 22. Ranking Member Granger knows that as a fellow Texan, she is incredibly familiar with the capabilities and importance of these aircraft. The V-22 Osprey is one of the most in-demand and flexible aircraft in DOD's inventory. Unfortunately, the Navy Marine Corps failed to request any in this year's budget request, despite not yet reaching their programs of record. These aircraft will be flown into the 2050s, so failing to fully procure a significant number before the line potentially closes will pose an avoidable warfighter war, war capability risk. While, while I am disappointed that we could not add additional aircraft at this time, I look forward to working with the chair and ranking members to provide support for the program as we move forward. And I yield back. Ms. McCollum. I look forward to working with the gentleman, but here's another example of being asked to do more with, with what I have um, and, and you know, the program increase. And program increases are what we'll have to maybe take a hard look at to do something that we all want to see, and that is uh, help with, with the pay that our soldiers, airmen, marine, guardians uh, are getting. But folks, I, I'm serious about this. I want, to work, I want to work on the previous discussion with what we do for military benefits, but at the same time, I'm hearing, especially from the other side of the aisle, I want more for programming, I want more for weapons, I want more for everything. So I want you to help me out more telling me what, what, what you propose to cut as we go to the floor. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Calvert. I just want to uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for yielding time. I, I just want to share my enthusiasm for the V-22. It's a tremendous asset to the United States military. Now we're delivering uh, folks uh, on aircraft carriers. We got rid of the CODs and we're using V-22s, thank God. It's a much better way to get on an aircraft carrier, use it for medical evacuations, our covert operations, any number of things. And so uh, you're right, we need to make sure that we get adequate numbers before that line is shut down and uh, look forward to supporting you in the future and uh, working with the chairman on that, chair lady, I should say. Thank you very much. Yield back. Whatever. Ms. Granger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I thank my colleague from Texas for raising this important issue and appreciate his interest in the B-22 program. The program is just one example of why the top line funding level for this bill is inadequate. B-22s are essential for the Navy and Marine Corps, especially as we prepare for increased operations as China becomes more aggressive in the region. I look forward to working with the chair and the gentleman on this important program as we move forward, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to be heard? The gentleman has withdrawn. Mr. Carter. Oh, Mr. Carter, <coughs> so, so sorry. Mr. Carter. Oh, thank you, Matt. Madam Chair. I have the rise and support Mr. Gonzalez's request, and I'll be glad to work with him in the, in the leadership in conference. Thank you, back. Any other members wishing to be heard? Not Mr. Gonzalez, you want to? 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the Chair and Ranking Members for their support. With that, I withdraw the amendment. The gentleman withdraws the amendment. Okay. Are there any further amendments or discussion? Seeing none, I recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio for a motion, and I ask for your support for this bill. Yes, Madam Chair, I move to favorably report the Defense Appropriations Act 2023 to the House. Questions on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Yeas and nays. I was waiting. <laughs> A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of recorded vote, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes aye. Mr. Amaday. No. Mr. Amaday votes no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mrs. Bustos. Mr. Calvert. No. Mr. Calvert votes no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter votes no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright votes aye. Mr. Case. Aye. Mr. Case votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Christ. Aye. Mr. Christ votes aye. Mr. Cuellar. Ms. Deloro. Aye. Ms. Deloro votes aye. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman votes no. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes aye. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger votes no. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder. Aye. Mr. Harder votes aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes no. Ms. Herrera Butler. No. Ms. Herrera Butler votes no. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes no. Ms. Kaptur. Aye. Ms. Kaptur votes aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence votes aye. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes aye. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes no. Ms. McCollum. McCollum votes aye. Ms. McCollum votes aye. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng votes aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse votes no. Mr. Palazzo. No. Mr. Palazzo votes no. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree votes aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers votes no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes no. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan votes aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes aye. Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes aye. Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood votes aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Yes. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes no. Mr. Diaz Bellart votes no. Mr. Adderholt? Mr. Adderholt votes no. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Espayat votes aye. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes aye. Mr. Cuellar. Uh, Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Tally.
We got your cheese going out of there. Oh, yeah, we can get you. We certainly can take care of it. There's three million and 18. We'll take care of this raise for sure. I guarantee you it's not 18 billion dollars. I'm driving. I was doing this thinking the same thing. Mike was like, where the hell did they come up with that number? The only thing I can think of is they, they took the tail you know, for time and other problems. Not to me. doesn't even come out of our budget. It comes out of the VA. <laughs> On this vote, the nays are 32, the nays are 26, and the uh, uh, bill is agreed to. Madam Chair? Yes. I ask for three days for the minority to file views. I ask unanimous Kent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the bill and, re and report just approved. Seeing no objections, so ordered. And three days. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lest you think it's we're going home at this <laughs> moment, uh, you know, think twice because the next uh, order of business, our final order of business today, is consideration of the legislative branch appropriations for fiscal year 2023. Uh, let's. Make a switch here. Mr. Ryan in for Ms. McCollum, and then we'll get started. And that's your ledge branch stuff? Okay, and uh, Chandler should be on. Okay. Um, do you want to okay. make any statements at MillCon tomorrow? Okay. Yeah, no.
The committee will come to order. Again, our final order of business today is the consideration of the Ledge Branch Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2023. With that, I will now recognize Mr. Ryan to present the bill. Thank you. Full service operation here, Chairman <laughs> Deloro. Uh, I'm pleased to present the 2023 appropriations bill written by our legislative branch subcommittee. I very much appreciate the hard work and collegial attitude of all the members of the subcommittee, and particularly uh, the contributions and cooperation of our ranking member, Ms. Herrera Butler. It's a pleasure working with you. Um, this is a good bill. It reflects the participation and hard work of our subcommittee members, as well as good ideas we received from many sources, including our House colleagues and outside experts and advocates. The fiscal year 2023 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill provides $5.7 billion, a 20% increase over the fiscal year 2022 enacted levels. It is vital that we prioritize initiatives to expand a diverse and talented workforce on Capitol Hill. The bill provides $20.6 million to expand the House Paid Internship Program, increasing the amount to $46,800 per member office. The bill creates a House Intern Resource Office, providing necessary resources to help create a pipeline for students from all backgrounds to come and work on Capitol Hill. And our veterans and military families, this bill increases funding for the Green and Gold Congressional Aid Program, formerly known as the Wounded Warrior Program. Additionally, this year's bill makes important steps in exploring other areas where we can expand benefits for staff to compete with the private sector. This bill continues to focus on the importance of our staff's wellness and provides funding for the Office of Employee Assistance and the Office of Wellbeing to ensure staff have the resources they need to support needs of our community and to fund culturally sensitive mental health services so everyone feels comfortable seeking the support that they need. Our bill continues to invest in the House Modernization Initiative account by providing $10 million, an $8 million increase to make Congress more effective, efficient, and transparent on behalf of the American people. At the same time, the bill includes $8 million for the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights, allowing them to increase staffing so that the office may provide resources in the ongoing efforts for staff unionization. Protecting our nation's capital is paramount. This bill continues to make significant reforms and investments to strengthen the security of the House and surrounding Capitol complex and to support the United States Capitol Police Threats against members have increased over the last two years, and this must not be taken lightly, nor will we take lightly the safety of our staff and citizens who travel far and wide to visit the Capitol. Almost 70 percent of the Ledge Branch increase is targeted toward security measures within the Sergeant at Arms, Architect of the Capitol, and Capitol Police budgets. This bill includes an increase of $576 million for the architect of the Capitol. This increase addresses critical gaps in our security posture, highlighted in various reports and assessments after the January 6th attack. This bill also includes funding to support our crumbling infrastructure. These buildings are old and in great need of repair. We can no longer defer maintenance to our utility tunnels, the West Plaza of the Rayburn Building, and construction activities for the library storage facility out at Fort Meade, just to name a few. This bill also includes $31 million to continue construction on the Cannon House Office Building. This bill includes various other provisions to ensure the Capitol Visitor Center and Capitol Complex are accessible for individuals with disabilities and all visitors who wish to tour the Capitol or meet with their member of Congress. The bill includes $105.6 million in increased funding for the Capitol Police, fully funding their request. This funding level is vital for Capitol Police training, recruitment, retention, equipment, 
readiness efforts, and wellness support. This funding allows the department to continue building on recommended security enhancements and provides resources to continue work on de-escalation and racial bias training. Over the past year, 219 officers have separated from the department due to retirements and resignations. The department is working hard to fill these gaps. Currently, there are over 100 officers in training and plans for an additional 14 classes of officers to begin training over the next year. Turning to other legislative branch agencies, the bill increases investments in Congress's analytical capacity. Funding for CRS, GAO, and CBO has been increased, further expanding capabilities for quicker response times to congressional requests, science and technology assistance, and financial analysis. This bill includes an increase of $37 million for the Library of Congress, as it is the subcommittee's duty to protect the valuable collections and preserve the library's ability to chronicle this great nation and provide access to our history for generations to come. It includes $3.9 million to continue the library's work on the Veterans History Project to collect and preserve the personal accounts of American War veterans. Finally, the bill includes language to permit DACA recipients to work for Congress and other legislative branch agencies. Language for the removal of statues or busts in the Capitol of those who tried to overthrow the government of the United States or were white supremacists. And language to prohibit the COLA for members of Congress. The lasting impact of the global pandemic and January 6th attack on our U.S. Capitol and law enforcement personnel continue to emphasize our responsibility to protect our nation's capital so we can serve our constituents effectively. This legislation builds off the important progress we've made in hiring and retaining staff and continues to remove barriers to public service for all Americans. Before I yield back, I would like to recognize the staff for all the hard work and time they have put into this bill. For my own staff, I would like to recognize Rachel Jenkins, from the Majority Subcommittee staff, I would like to thank Faye Cobb, Elizabeth Lafham, and Ryan Kinney. And from the Minority Subcommittee staff, I would like to thank Michelle Reinshuttle. Once again, I ask for your support for this bill, and I yield back my time. Before I yield to Mr. Rara Butler, does somebody have the licorice that they can pass back here to the dais as well? <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And we won't tell the Ways and Means Committee. I appreciate, uh, Chairman Ryan, your uh, working with you on the um, this legislative branch uh, uh, bill. And it, it's really been a pleasure. And to you, Chair DeLauro and Ranking Member Granger, it, it, I appreciate the chance to get to work with you all as we lead this tiny but mighty subcommittee. The recommendation, as was laid out, for fiscal 2023 ledge branch appropriations provides $5.7 billion, excluding funding for the Senate side uh, and the Senate programs. The bill includes investments in modernization of really outdated systems in the House of Representatives, and it's going to shape our ability to serve our constituents more effectively. It supports streamlining the legislative drafting process to help facilitate collaboration between members and committees and the Office of Ledge Council. If you've ever actually tried to drop a bill in the hopper, you know exactly how frustrating that process can be. Uh, it also encourages the implementation of new electronic systems to increase efficiency in the House as well as provide greater visibility for the public on the operation of the People's Chamber. This legislation reflects the reality of what has happened to the seat of democracy over the last two years. It allows Capitol Police to evolve and to keep pace with the complex challenges uh, the department now faces in fulfilling its critical mission. The increase allows for adequate staff, training, and resources that these responsibilities require as they continue to protect members of Congress, our staff, and the visitors to this Capitol campus. The bill provides the architect of the Capitol the resources necessary to ensure that the campus is safe, uh, is open and welcoming to all who work, live, and visit here by addressing critical infrastructure upgrades and executed, executing recommended security upgrades. 
The increases for the architect and for the Capitol Police, I believe, are justifiable, but with the significant of increases, Congress must be extremely thoughtful in the way that these projects are executed and insist on aggressive oversight over the funds being provided. I support the resources and directives needed to safely reopen the Capitol complex and modernize the agencies that Congress depends on. However, this legislation comes with a very steep 20.1% price increase in spending from FY22, which in and of itself uh, was, a, was over a 13% increase. And this one includes many controversial provisions. During a time of economic uncertainty throughout this country, Congress should be setting an example of fiscal responsibility, and instead the legislative branch is boasting a 20% increase. In addition, the legislation contains directives that polarize the priorities of the committee and of Congress. Therefore, I cannot support the bill in its current form, but I do remain hopeful um, that we'll be able to work together on, as the process moves forward in much the same way we did in the last appropriations bill. Thank you so much, Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, and Chairman Ryan again, and to the staff, Faye Cobb and Michelle Ryan Shuttle on our side for all your efforts in putting this bill together. Uh, and with that, I yield back to the gentleman from the state that produced eight U.S. presidents. Not one woman, though, the ninth Ninth times the, the charm with that. Thank you, Chairman Ryan. I'd like to now recognize myself for opening remarks. Uh, again, I would just say thank you to Chairman Ryan, to Ranking Member Herrera Butler, uh, for what is really a profound commitment to this bill. Uh, and thank you to the subcommittee staff for making it possible, and uh, including Faye Cobb, Elizabeth Lapham, Ryan Kinney, from the majority, and Michelle Ronshuttle from the minority. Thank you very, very much for the work that you do. Uh, and we all know here that this subcommittee is critical to the growth and progress of our democracy. Our work is strengthening our government and its capacity, <clears throat> its capacity to serve the American people. So I thank you again for your dedication. The legislative branch bill before us comes at a critical moment in time. On January 6, 2021, our nation understood more fully than ever before that our democracy is fragile. And now, more than a year later, we continue to learn more about that terrible day from the findings of the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack. This bill will continue to change the Capitol complex and culture to protect the Capitol and those who work in and visit these hallowed halls. The Legislative Branch Subcommittee held 10 hearings this year, including on the security the Capitol campus since the insurrection and on the budget request and developing needs of the Capitol Police. These hearings and the reality of, of our changing threats inform much of the work this subcommittee is doing and the $5.7 billion investments in this bill. Firstly, the bill provides $105.6 million in increased funding for the Capitol Police. With this funding and the committee report alongside it, we are providing substantial resources to support our Capitol Police. And in fact, they deserve our respect and our support and our resources. It's the, we also further want to enhance the security posture of the Capitol complex and protect members, staff, and visitors. We're also making an over $532 million investment in the architect of the Capitol to support significant enhancements to the physical security of our buildings. And with $38.8 million for the Sergeant at Arms, we are supporting initiatives that will enhance members' personal security. These increases and the long overdue changes that will be made as a result of them are based on independent security recommendations and signal our commitment to putting in place the measures that keep our buildings, staff, and visitors, and consequently our democracy safe. While we support members, congressional staff and their offices with enhanced security measures, we are also ensuring that they have the funding they need to best serve the constituents who put them here. After a decade of disinvestment, the 2022 government funding package provided historic investments in the resources staff needed to serve the people we represent. This bill builds on those achievements, provides wellness and professional support to ensure we can recruit and retain a talented and diverse workforce. But the investments in staff do not end with permanent employees. We are ensuring congressional interns receive the livable wage they deserve by providing over $24 million to expand the House Paid Internship Program by providing nearly $47,000 for each member office. 
an increase of $11,800. Providing interns a livable wage will enable more young people, especially those who represent the diversity that is so central to our nation, to gain the on-the-job experience of interning, of interning in the Congress, which helps to ensure our future workforce is more diverse as well. This bill also includes language allowing DREAMers to work in congressional and other legislative branch offices. And finally, we are providing significant resources to modernize the Congress. With $10 million for the House Modernization Initiatives account, we are making the House more effective, efficient, and transparent. And with information technology, cybersecurity, more digitalization, and other critical developments, we are modernizing the legislative branch agencies that support our work. These investments continue the important work we have already done to make the Capitol safer and to sustain our democracy for the future. I will continue to advocate for the funding in this bill, which prioritizes our safety, our diversity, and progress, in turn making us better equipped to serve those who put us here to do so. Once again, I want to thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler and all of the subcommittee members for their work. And I urge support for this important bill and we're happy to recognize Ranking Member Granger for her opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding. Uh, before I start, I want to recognize Subcommittee Chair Mr. Ryan. Uh, this is the last legislative branch appropriations bill he'll bring before the committee, and I want to thank him for his dedication to improving the Congress during his time as chair. Now to the bill before us. I want to thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler for their work and also acknowledge the efforts of the committee staff. This bill does many good things. It will enable the Congress to operate more efficiently by modernizing electronic systems that support the legislative process. This bill allows the architect of the Capitol to perform delayed maintenance as well as implement safety enhancements to address buildings and other infrastructure in desperate need of attention. This bill also recognizes this service and sacrifice of our Capitol Police. It, uh, if it built their uh, workforce and, and both sworn officers and civilians and makes security improvements. The bill also provides resources to implement the Inspector General's recommendations to enable the Capitol Police to perform its mission. Unfortunately, I do have some concerns about the bill in its current form. Total spending for the legislative branch increases by more than 20 percent. This is based on a top-line funding level that was set with no Republican support. This legislation also includes provisions that prioritize government resources for items that sound like a wish list for the far left. This item should these, these items should not be carried in a bill that will need bipartisan support to get the president's desk. These are out of touch with how Americans expect us to spend their hard-earned tax dollars. As this bill moves through the process, I hope that the spending and policy issues are addressed and that we develop a bill both sides can support. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments about the bill? Oh, my gosh. Yes, right. Chair. Okay. Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I want to thank Chair Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler and your staff for your leadership putting this bill together. I want to particularly thank you for including language in this bill that makes process, progress on dozens of recommendations, bipartisan recommendations made by the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. The bill addresses a wide range of topics that include boosting congressional capacity, encouraging member collaboration, improving the recruitment and retention of staff, and modernizing House technology. But let me mention just a, a few specifics. It recommends authorization of reimbursement for educational expenses for House staff, including tuition. Why does that matter? Well, we want to make sure our staff gets those professional development opportunities. It includes establishment of a House intern resource office why does that matter? It matters to coordinate the services for our interns so that they can have an intern experience that's better. Uh, it includes enhanced funding for the modernization initiatives account that will be used to implement numerous modernization projects. This matters. It matters because if Congress is going to be an institution that's capable of solving big problems, 
uh, it needs to have capacity. It needs to have modern technology. It needs to be able to recruit and retain capable staff. It needs to be an institution that promotes collaboration. Making Congress work better for the American people is a worthwhile investment, and this bill makes important and lasting investments in the legislative branch to ensure that we are efficiently and effectively serving our constituents. So I want to thank the chair and the ranking member and the staff for including these priorities, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank the committee for the hard work, but this bill provides critical funding to programs essential to working here in Congress. Uh, we are including funding to support staffers and officers on the Capitol ground. And as the January 6 hearings proceed, we must continue to support those who work to keep members, staff, and visitors safe. We are talking about capital improvements. Understand this is where we work, but this is the people's house. And the investment in the architect of this Congress and the improvements and the updates to modernize not only benefit us in doing our job, but benefits those who, who visit and those who must also work in this building. Uh, we know that the bill includes much needed funding to help expand internship opportunities to interns of diverse backgrounds. Why is that important? It's because this country that we love and pledge allegiance to is a country of diversity. And those who sit in the seat of this Congress should inspire the next generation through our internship programs. And that's something I'm very proud of because it allows students from all backgrounds, especially underrepresented backgrounds, to gain the practical and professional skills needed to succeed and thrive in their careers. And we know that internships is more than just giving someone a snapshot of what we do. We're planting the seed for those in the next generation to, at minimum, have respect for the work of protecting our Constitution. I strongly uh, urge my colleagues to support this legislation. And as we move forward, um, there is a saying that we hear all the time because all of us fly, and that is put the mask on yourself first so that you can help others. And when I look at this budget and I review it, I am confident that we will be given the environment and the resources for us to be the most efficient to the people of America. I yield back. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support of FY23 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill and highlight one of the provisions in the report that increase access to free menstrual products in the Capitol Complex buildings. Period poverty is a hidden inequity that affects millions of people across our nation. For over half the population, access to menstrual products is an essential healthcare necessity that is frequently overlooked and ignored. Nobody should ever be forced to put their health in jeopardy or suffer embarrassment or stigmas because they're unable to afford menstrual products. It's time for the seat of our nation's democracy to take the lead in providing this basic necessity for visitors and our staff alike. The language in the report directs the architect of the Capitol to provide menstrual products in our restrooms throughout the Capitol complex buildings at no cost, just like we do paper towels, toilet paper, and soap. For years, I have fought for this basic service to be provided in the Capitol beginning in fiscal year 21 with the feasibility study and the scope and cost of making period products available in our restrooms. I want to thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler and all the staff for their work on this bill and urge my colleagues to support it. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herrera Butler for your work in putting together this bill that moves this institution forward in a way that allows us to effectively meet the needs of our constituents while ensuring the Capitol complex is safe for members, staff, and visitors. 
This is a bill worth celebrating. It makes critical investments in our commitment to workers' rights and equity, providing additional resources for the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights, and allowing DACA recipients to work in our offices. This bill will help ensure interns are paid a livable wage and establish a House Intern Resource Office to help facilitate strong internship experiences. I especially appreciate your work with me to help support House employees with caregiving duties, including learning more about the challenges congressional staff face in accessing affordable childcare and developing solutions. This bill will help protect the Capitol and implement the recommended security enhancements following the January 6th insurrection and ensure the Capitol Police have the resources needed to recruit and retain a strong workforce. It will take critical steps to make the House of Representatives a welcoming environment by supporting the ongoing work to install gender neutral restrooms, providing feminine hygiene products at no cost, and removing statues of white supremacists and those who took up arms against the United States. In its entirety, this bill represents an important step in our work to improve transparency, de increase diversity, and instill equity across the legislative branch. I am proud of the progress this bill provides and the hard work being put into it, especially the work of you, Mr. Chairman. We will miss you and we'll miss your leadership. I urge members to support this bill and I yield back. Mr. Espion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I rise in support of this legislative branch appropriations bill. The bill represents $5.7 billion asked for the legislative branch, an important and necessary 20% jump over fiscal year 2022. I think we can all agree that the grave January 6 attack on the Capitol warrant bold investment in securing the Capitol Hill complex to ensure that everyone, staff, members, and visitors are safe. The bill does just that by providing $105.6 million increase for Capitol Police. Uh, the increase will uh, help hire more cops and fulfill security recommendations made in the wake of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Um, I also uh, want to thank the Chairwoman and Chairman Ryan and the Ranking Member for including priorities that I've uh, championed, uh, namely, uh, for the first time ever, the bill provides $350,000 for the creation of a House Intern Resource Office. Uh, mandating outreach to historically underrepresented community. It also includes 1.3 million and directing the first ever United States Capitol Police body camera pilot program. Uh, another important first is $500,000 for house staffers to have the ability to form a union. Not only the, the bill also includes a proposal I am a staunch proponent of to hire beneficiaries of the deferred action a child hall arrival program, also known as DREAMers, overriding existing restrictions. Lastly, the bill expands the availability of cultural component, uh, competent uh, mental health services. Uh, I'm very happy with this bill and I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Congresswoman Roy Allard. I rise in uh, strong support uh, of this bill, and I thank the subcommittee chair for including some of my priorities. I am particularly uh, thrilled the funding bill includes my request to allow DACA recipients to be employed in Congress and other legislative branch agencies. Under the DACA program, applicants are granted work authorization to enable them to pursue their careers and to give back to their communities. The value of their contributions was never more clear than during the pandemic as they continued to work as our nation's teachers, our doctors, nurses, and other essential workers. The bill will right a wrong and allow DACA recipients to serve in the People's House. DACA recipients are valued, productive members of our American society, and it is only right that they are allowed to serve their community and the country in our nation's capital. 
I yield back. Congresswoman Kaptur. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank Chairman Ryan uh, and wish him the very best in the days, months, and years ahead, and Ranking Member Herrera Butler for their <coughs> work on this very important bill, and thank Chairwoman DeLauro and Ranking Member Granger. Um, I really appreciate uh, Chairman Ryan's work to include priorities that are important to the people that I represent. Uh, certainly the uh, improvements to the Capitol co complex itself, the first branch mentioned in the Constitution, the legislative branch. And um, in that regard, I'd like to um, state and place on the record uh, deepest appreciation to the brave men and women of the U.S. Capitol Police. Every single day, they put on the badge and they go to work to protect us and our democracy, and they deserve our unending gratitude, but they also deserve our substantive support, and this bill does it. I am proud to support increased funding for the U.S. Capitol Police, who will receive an increase of $105.6 million for hiring new officers, for training and recruitment, for wellness programs, as well as security improvements. They defended this institution, and we cannot thank them enough. Just to place on the record, since January 6th, uh, 200 uh, of last year, 219 officers have separated from the department. Four through death, 81 retirements, and 126 separations. Ten uh, are still out due to injuries, and uh, it's important to understand that just as in any battle, there are scars that are stress-related that will require addressing as the months tick off. And we are committed to ensuring that all injuries are dealt with, and uh, this bill provides that to the greatest extent that we can. I also wanted to highlight a couple of provisions that are important. Uh, the Congressional Office of International Leadership is a widely regarded program. Many of our members link to parliaments across the world. And uh, the COIL program supports vital leadership development, especially in nations that began to, subsequent to the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, that began to build their own democracies. And uh, going back to Dr. Billington, who headed the library when uh, those programs first started, honestly, we have made such a difference around the world. I also wanted to uh, thank the chairman and ranking member for your work on the botanical gardens and the important collections that they have and help to expand their educational outreach to botanical gardens across the country, uh, the urban public gardens included, to build upon the horticultural expertise they have and education, especially in urban food challenged communities. They have, a, they have an unmet potential to help our country from coast to coast. And finally, for the architect of the Capitol, uh, this bill has the first ever energy audit of the Capitol complex itself. Can you believe it? It's taken this long. Uh, to be a world leader in energy efficiencies, we here in the Congress can leverage new energy technologies to maximize the integration of clean, renewable, and alternative energy sources and conservation through the legislative branch and teach the nation based on what we're learning. So let's hope we can do all that. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of this bill. And I thank Chairman Ryan. And I have to say, uh, as a fellow Buckeye, it has just been a joy to serve with you. Thank you for all you've done for the nation. Thank you very much. And I yield back. Um, Mr. Ruppersberger. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. First thing, uh, I would like to um, thank the committee, thank the chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman Ryan, you've done a great job. I remember that you and I came in in 2003, and I'm a little older than you are, and I thought for sure that I'd be leaving before you were. So good luck in your, in your future, and uh, we're always going to be behind you. Uh, I also would uh, like to thank uh, Chairman Laura. Ranking Member Granger for uh, your leadership in pulling this together, and also uh, Ranking Member Herrera. Whew, got that out of the way. Now, uh, we, we, uh, 
First, I'd like to thank you for including my recommendations into the manager's amendment to increase the draft bill's funding for the Library of Congress, uh, the mass deassification uh, program. This increase of $500,000 will bring the total funding level of $1 million in FY23 for the library. Uh, this funding will ensure valuable documents are not lost and remain accessible uh, to, for years to come. Secondly, I'm pleased this bill includes significant increases in funding for cybersecurity and bolsters investments to further secure the capital complex. Uh, it also includes increased funding to improve training and improve wellness support for the Capitol Police who were attacked on January 6, 2021. Specifically, I'm pleased this bill includes language to allow overtime earned by sworn officers of Capitol Police to count towards retirement calculations. The United States Capitol Police are one of the only federal law enforcement agencies where portions of your overtime do not count as base pay for retirement. I stand in strong support this provision and urge my colleagues to support it as well. Lastly, I want to reiterate my strong support for the $105.6 million increase in the United States Capitol Police budget, FY22. This funding will provide the resources to fulfill the necessary security enhancements for the Capitol complex in light of the January 6 attacks. Once again, I'd like to thank the subcommittee for all of their hard work, and I yield back. Mr. Aguilar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Herr Butler and the subcommittee staff um, as a member of the January 6th Committee as well as a member of House Administration uh, for their thoroughness in, in how they have gone about uh, their work uh, to resource uh, the U.S. Capitol Police and, and protect this, this body. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to thank the chairman for including uh, the DACA provision that uh, Chairwoman uh, Lucille robel Allard uh, mentioned as well. This is something that I've introduced in the past and uh, appreciate um, uh, the inclusion of the committee's um, uh, language uh, with respect to this. DACA, individual to DACA status are a benefit to the Congress uh, just as they are a benefit to the country. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that uh, we have included this uh, again and look forward to uh, having conversations with uh, Chairman Quigley uh, in FSGG uh, to, to accompany similar language, uh, but appreciate uh, the work that the subcommittee has done and um, uh, look forward to its passage. Mr. Case. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as a now four-year member of, of this subcommittee, I'm also very much going to miss our chair, and I'm going to especially miss his, his interaction with our ranking member. I've, had, I've learned so much incredibly useless information about Ohio and Washington <laughs> in four years uh, that it's been well a real joy. But thank you so much for, for, for really um, modeling how a subcommittee should operate, um, and I wish you well, Chair. Um, you know, every time I go through this uh, appropriation cycle with uh, this particular subcommittee, it's always um, impressive all over again uh, to really understand what's going on uh, under the surface of operating the legislative branch and of the tens of thousands of people who have such commitment, uh, expertise, and value uh, to this institution uh, that, that uh, care about us and keep us going every single day. And so I hope that uh, through this budget we are saying in part thank you I think we are, I, but I hope that, um, that uh, you feel it wherever you are listening in on our deliberations on, on your budget. Um, there are many good uh, points in this, in this particular bill. Uh, many of my colleagues have al always sp already spoken to many, many of them. So I'm just going to take one uh, that I think is particularly relevant, and that is the, the increase to the budget of the Congressional Budget Office, um, which, um, which, uh, in, which we, in which we met their request for a substantial increase. And I think we can all appreciate that in, um, in what I, I, I think are perilous times for our federal budget, federal deficits, when, when our debates are going to become more intense, when our, the sophistication of the issues that we're going to have to face in terms of the federal budget are becoming more intense themselves, uh, that we need uh, both quantity and quality of information 
the last place any of us want to be is in a situation where we cannot access the independent objective um, expertise on budget issues as we go down the road. We don't want this to be you know, rationed uh, just to a particular uh, committee, uh, rationed just to a particular caucus, but for all members uh, to have access to CBO uh, to uh, make um, very difficult decisions with. I mean, it's not just uh, the number of folks that we, that we include in the CBO, although they do need more people, uh, but also um, their own uh, particular um, um, efforts at modeling and analytical capacity, like a lot of other things, are becoming a lot more complicated, and they need access uh, to better approaches themselves, and these, these approaches um, cost money, and that is money well spent. And so I think that really, um, as we take a look at, at um, aspects of this bill that are going to be of particular value to us, though we, know we may not think about it every single day, a CBO uh, definitely ranks uh, up there, and so I, I support uh, this bill very much, not just for that reason, but for all of the other reasons that have already been mentioned. I yield back. Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairman Ryan, I want to thank you, and I know this is the last time that you'll be leading an effort uh, to, uh, to steer a bill through the legislative process, and I want to congratulate you, because having been in your shoes with Lead French, many years. Uh, I know it's not an easy one. Uh, and rank, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, congratulations to you as well. Um, this is a bill that continues to strengthen and modernize our legislative branch. And as uh, the former chair or ranking member of the subcommittee for 10 years, I, I really understand that this bill has challenges that require us to confront some of the darker moments in, in American history and also you know, ha holds tremendous responsibility in terms of our, the, the importance of making sure that we can fund a strong and co-equal legislative branch of government. In the wake of the January 6th insurrection, we must not forget to challenge that, that we must not forget to challenge hate that echoes from the past and lashes out in the present. This bill does just that by appropriating funds for the enhancement of security in the Capitol complex. We increase funding to hire additional officers, improve training, and bolster wellness support for the Capitol Police. I was also pleased to see that the bill includes important provisions to increase operational transparency of the Office of the Inspector General for the Capitol Police. The Capitol Police IG is not currently required to post its reports publicly. There are no reports available on its website, and we need transparency now more than ever. Critically, the bill reflects our values by directing the architects of the Capitol to remove statues of figures who participated in the Confederate Army. And I'm glad the bill includes an increase in the account that provides for congressional office budgets. We all recognize the challenges involved in hiring and retaining talented and diverse staff. And importantly, it includes more funding for intern pay. This is an important, recruit, this is an important element for recruiting top talent from diverse backgrounds. I'm also pleased that the bill highlights the lack of a uniform congressional staff directory and provides a timeline for creation of this database for staffers to identify their peers in other offices. This is a welcome step in the direction of the modernization of Congress. I look forward to seeing this bill uh, come come forth uh, through the full committee, and I go back to balance my time. Are there any other members wishing to uh, make opening remarks? Yes, Mr. Newhouse. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, just wanted to make a few comments. As has been made known, uh, Chairman Ryan is, is is leaving us for greener pastures. And unlike Mr. Case, I think the trivia of Ohio and Washington has been very interesting. So thank you for Mr. Rare Butler and Mr. Ryan for, I've never had to look up so much interesting facts about the Buckeye State before to try to keep up. But, um, this is a, you know, a lot of people think of Ledge Branch as the backwater committee. It's not at all. We've been the point of the spear this last couple of years. A lot of important decisions have been made. And, uh, um, and will continue to be. So thank you for your leadership there. You know, things about modernization, Mr. Kilmer's pointed out, are very important. The safety issues, we can't express our appreciation enough to the Capitol Police. But you know, when you have a 20% increase in your, in your budget on the heels of a 13% increase, it requires additional scrutinization. And I can't tell you how important that the aspect of transparency is from all the different offices and responsibilities that the Ledge Branch Committee oversees, how important that is, and, it, and I would just like to put in my um, 
two cents that we need to continue to ask for that and, and increase that transparency so we can make the best decisions possible. Um, so with those comments, this has been a lot of good work. Uh, I think we've made a lot of progress, but I think a lot more needs to be uh, achieved here as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rare Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just have and one. Now I'm going to win. Just have one comment, Mr. Newhouse, and that's, um, <clears throat> I don't know about greener pastures, okay? What can I say here? I, you know, I think the greenest pastures are right here in, in, in the House. But um, seeing no other members wishing to make opening remarks, I'd like to recognize Mr. Ryan to offer a manager's amendment. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, everyone, for your well wishes. Uh, while I'm leaving this House, I'm not leaving this Capitol. I'm just going to try to get some better office space uh, across the street. Um, Madam Chair, I rise to offer a manager's amendment. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. This amendment that has been agreed to on both sides with the support of Ms. Herrera-Butler, uh, this bipartisan manager's amendment makes five technical changes to the bill and report along with three report language changes. The first report language change increases the amount for the library's mass deacidification program from $500,000 to $1 million. The second report language change updates the BARD modernization paragraph to be in line with program needs for the library's fiscal year 2023 request. The third report language change adds a new paragraph directing GPO to ensure the government info website is transparent and easy to find ledge branch documents. Again, the minority had no issues with these additions. I urge support of the amendment. I urge its adoption. Are there any members who wish to be heard on the amendment? We don't need any more time to close. No. Right, Yield back the balance. The question is on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Further amendment. Excuse me. Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to speak on his amendment. Uh, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, Chairman Ryan, and Ranking Member Herrera Butler. I have an amendment here that I think everybody can support. This is something that uh, I would hope that uh, we can all come together on. I, I think we're wasting limited and valuable resources by requiring members of Congress to go through magnometers when we're, we're entering the House floor. Since the pandemic began, the Americans' right to petition their government has been restricted because access to the House is difficult. Now, as more of our constituents resume travel to D.C. happily, the lines to enter the House office building grow longer and longer due to shortage of public interests. I'm sure all of your constituents have complained about that. Uh, and uh, the waiting is really unnecessary, time-consuming lines to enter these buildings. This body continues business in committee rooms, members' offices, sometimes even in the hallways, none of which require security screening for members of Congress defies common sense to treat the le uh, threat level on the House floor any differently. We're adults, duly elected, and trusted by our constituents to serve in the House of Representatives. I have every faith that my colleagues behave, will behave and follow the House rules, which clearly outlaw firearms on the House floor. These resources should be redirected and moved to the public entrances of the buildings to alleviate the long lines the American people are experiencing while trying to see their elected representatives. I would hope we can all support that. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Ryan. Madam Chair, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. Uh, while we all feel frustrated by the, some of the processes we've had to implement, um, this amendment would repurpose the magnetometers used to screen members of Congress and the House floor and place them at the external doors of the House office buildings. This proposal would cause gaping holes in the security of the House floor 
a space that was attacked only last year. While it is important to continue working to open the Capitol at a sustainable, safe pace for the American people, this amendment would be a harmful solution. I urge my colleagues across the aisle to be patient as the United States Capitol Police works to balance, I hope you can hear me here, works to balance the departure of 219 sworn officers in one year, in one year, with maintaining an open, safe environment for you, our staffs, and our visitors. This year, the department worked to temporarily alleviate staffing strains and allow for the Capitol complex to safely reopen by hiring contract security officers, an effort that Republicans have opposed. Capitol Police is working hard to fill these hiring gaps. They currently have over 100 officers in training and have an additional 14 classes of officers slated to begin training over the next year. The bill in front of you provides the department with the ability to recruit, hire, train, and deploy new recruit officers, lateral transfers, and rehire sworn uh, annuits uh, to rebuild its ranks. In addition, our bill addresses serious gaps in security measures that have lapsed for far too long. All of these measures allow the department to reopen the campus safely in a phased fashion that balances security with having access to an open environment. This amendment is not a balanced approach and does not reflect the current security needs of members of Congress or the Capitol campus. I once again stress the negative impact this would have on House floor security and urge a no vote on this amendment. And if we want to expedite this and get this done, the best thing uh, that my friend can do with his colleagues is vote in support of the legislative branch appropriations bill that will allocate the resources necessary to do this as expeditiously as possible. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Ms. Herrera Butler. Comment on the amendment. Uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. I, I think it we can. Um, I, I don't understand the logic between um, saying we don't have enough resources and we're we and it's true we are at a deficit with police officers. We've been working actively to address. Um, in many ways, we have done so in last budget, and hopefully, we'll get to a place in this budget where we are able to support it. However, taking those officers, at least two, maybe three, at a magnometer off the House floor and putting them in other places on the campus to facilitate more constituents coming in, to me, seems like two birds with one stone. I actually think we're taking away uh, with limited resources by, by making them stand there and do the wand thing. Um, it, it just seems like it's a little bit more, honestly, it doesn't seem like it's making it more secure. It seems like it's the image of making it more secure. And I just think it, the gentleman's amendment could make things more efficient. So I yield its adoption. Go back. Ms. Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. Unfortunately, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have gone to extreme in making threats or even spewing violent rhetoric against other members of Congress. In one instance, last year, a member of Congress posted to their social media a violent video showing them killing, killing another member of Congress. Let me say that again. The video showed a member of Congress killing their colleague. This political violence has no place in Congress. In another instance last year, a member of Congress suggested that another member of Congress was a terrorist, that their colleague was a terrorist, and implying that they would take part in a violent attack, perpetuating Islamophobia and spewing hateful rhetoric. According to a Capitol Police report, the number of threats made against Congress has increased significantly, with a 107% increase in threats against members compared to 
2020, last year. Sadly, this has led to many members of Congress and their loved ones in fear for their own safety, even in the halls of Congress. This is unacceptable, and any efforts or amendments that would undermine the security of members while voting should be defeated. This amendment is out of touch with our everyday reality on the floor, would make it less safe and prevent Capitol Police from doing their job to protect us. We cannot let violence or a threat of it become the mainstream, especially in the halls of Congress. And I urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment, and I yield back. Mr. Cole. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of the amendment, probably for the most personal of reasons. Uh, when you reach my age, you have enough metal in your body to set off every magnetometer <laughs> known to man. And I do every time I go on the floor. I know Mr. Trone has that problem. I know my classmate, Mr. Ruppersberger, has that problem. Um, we actually deal with this issue in rules on occasion. I offered the suggestion, if we are worried about members doing this, and as my friend Mr. Calvert pointed out, we don't appear to be worried about them doing it in any building in Congress except the Capitol building, just make the members go through the regular uh, you know, uh, metal thermometers that, that all the public and all our staff go through to enter the building. There is no reason at all to have these things uh, around the floor. And frankly, it's an enormous inconvenience to staff that is going back and forth on a regular basis. It's an enormous inconvenience to members when they're going back and forth. They would have just had to, if you just made them do it once coming in the building, that should be enough, unless, you know, you've watched The Godfather too many times and you think there's a something tight behind a toilet someplace. But, uh, you know, th there's a better way to do this than, than doing this uh, through the doors. And last point, when you get called off the floor, you've got to, of course, do it again. If we're going to do this, let's at least put these things beyond the restrooms. Again, when you reach my age, that's an important <laughs> point of call. Uh, and there's no need to come back and be wand yet again. So, uh, again, I, I, I'm sympathetic to my friends that worry about security. I think that's a legitimate concern. But having them going onto the floor just simply isn't necessary when you can have them coming into the building, do it one time uh, at all. And uh, so I would uh, respectfully hope that we could support the amendment and at least do that and redeploy both the, the – this can't be the most exciting assignment for a Capitol Hill police officer. Uh, and we, believe me, they now all know, all of us that have metal in our body, they couldn't be more cooperative, they're the nicest people on the planet, they try and facilitate it, but that's not what they're there for. They'd rather be doing something that's more serious. Put them on the perimeters where they actually can protect people, and if you want to, make members go through, just like our staff has to do, and stand outside uh, uh, Rayburn for 30 minutes every morning. I, that would probably settle this problem pretty quick. But uh, that's where the security needs to be. That's where the access needs to be. It does not need to be on the House floor. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. I'm going to recognize Ms. Capture, but I just want to let folks know that in, in about, well, just a very few minutes, there are probably eight to nine votes that are going to be called. I would like us very, very much to be able to finish up the Ledge Branch bill before we, uh, we, before we move forward. Ms. Capture. Yes, I would just like to comment. I think I've served longer than anybody else in this room today. I might be wrong about that, but I think I'm right. Um, when I came to Congress, it was a friendly place. Tip O'Neill and Bob Michael sang to the president at the holidays. And members had good relationships on both sides of the aisle. About a year ago, one of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle did an ad out in front of the Capitol. I was appalled. The end of the ad, there was a gunshot. It was pretty clear who that was supposed to be aimed at, our speaker. I was appalled. The person was not a member of my party. It was absolutely un-American. We've had individuals on the other side of the aisle bring firearms onto the floor. That's why those detectors have been put up. I hate them. I hate to go through them. 
I've never brought a gun on the floor. I came from a family where our dad, strongest man I ever knew, he could take anybody out with his fists. He didn't need a gun. Every other member of the family had a gun. They were all veterans. They respected a weapon. We live in a different era now. I think that a reasonable compromise here to help people like Tom Cole and others, um, I think we need a more modern technology than what we're asked to walk through now. I resent it every time I have to walk through those. I don't deserve that. No member does. We have some wild creatures who roam the floor. And we have to take care of that. So um, I've witnessed fights not between women on the floor. I've witnessed them among men. I don't know some of the new members very well. But I wouldn't trust any one of them with a weapon, quite frankly. And so um, we got a problem. And I think the gentleman is well-intentioned. But I think technology can lead us forward. And I would just urge the chair of the committee and the ranking member to consider more modern technology, work with the Department of Defense or who are Homeland Security, uh, some of the committees that um, uh, have a pretty good knowledge on this. But sadly, we have some people that can't contain themselves. And I think we have to protect the membership. I just wanted to express that opinion, and I thank the members very much. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on this amendment? There's no further debate. <clears throat> Gentleman is recognized for an amendment of, to speak to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now I know why some folks want to go over the Senate where there are no magnometers. Uh, I, uh, I think we ought to restore the level of trust in our colleagues and operate within the House rules and uh, redirect those resources where they're needed the most. Uh, with that, I yield back. Question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Days and days. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, raise your hand. Sufficient number being in support. A recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Yes. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Yes. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. Deloro. No. Ms. Deloro mm -hmm. votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. No. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. No. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Aye. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. No. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Aye. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Aye. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Aye. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor votes no. Mr. Kilmer. No. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. No. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. No. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. No. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Le Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. No. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Aye. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. Yes. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. No. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. <laughs> Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. No. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Aye. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. Nope. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Aye. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Aye. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. 
Ms. Underwood. No. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Aye. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. No. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Bishop? No. How you vote? Mr. Bishop votes no. no. Any member wishing to change their vote or record their vote? Okay. The clerk will tally. While the clerk is doing that, if I just might say a word with regard to the chair uh, who has served in the Congress for 19 years on the committee since 2007. Uh, and I think it may have been your Italian grandmother that linked us together all those years <laughs> ago. But so thank you so, so much for your leadership. Um, uh, on, the, on this committee, but just overall in understanding um, the plight of working men and women in this country and how government is there to make a difference in their lives and using your perch in this institution to help to make a difference uh, for people in their lives and to being a voice along with Ms. Kaptur about middle America. And so thank you. Thank you for your service. On this vote, the yeas are 26, the nays are 31. The uh, amendment is not adopted. Are uh, there further amendments? We have two more amendments to go. I would really like just to see if, if we can finish up. Ms. Herrera, Bob. I'm in. Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, should we uh, ask for dispense with reading? The gentlewoman yes. is recognized to speak on behalf of her amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment prohibits the use of resources going forward toward any of the studies or reports in Ledge Branch 2023 uh, report until the Capitol complex is fully opened. Um, I, I think uh, members have used the legislative branch. Um, I really feel like we've moved a lot of priorities, or I should say the majority has moved a lot of priorities in this bill that we frankly don't agree with. Um, and I feel like if those are still the priorities of this committee, we can put those on hold until at least the, the, the campus is completely open. And I know there have been a number of challenges there, getting enough staff, getting enough trained officers, hiring contractors. We've been working towards that. At the very least, I'm proposing this amendment to put on hold uh, those examining, and let me give you a couple of examples, examining what additional meat alternatives can be served in the cafeterias on campus. Um, I want to put a hold on assisting house offices in hiring and retaining individuals with a criminal record. Not that those things are not worthy. I'm just saying that I think our number one priority should be opening completely the Capitol complex for those people that we all serve. So I think we need to pause before creating duplicative training courses and other report directives. I just think they just shouldn't be the priority at, the, at this time. So my amendment will, won't stop any of those things from happening. It just allows the agencies that permit Congress to operate with greater bandwidth to focus on getting our doors fully reopened to the public. So with that, I urge a yes vote on this amendment. Mr. Ryan. Recognize. I mean, Madam Chair, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment prohibiting, uh, prohibiting the fun, use of funds for new studies and reports requested by members of Congress until the Capitol complex is reopened is not necessary and I will not uh, expedite the reopening of the Capitol and will not ex expedite the reopening of the Capitol complex. We must be patient. We'd all love uh, to reopen fully. However, the safety of members, staff and visitors remains the number one priority of this subcommittee. Uh, I know my colleagues across the aisle have heard enough regarding COVID excuses in the January 6th attack. However, these two events have changed our lives in many ways, and the impacts of these changes have been long-lasting. The Capitol complex is uh, reopening in a phased approach. Over the last two to three years, the number of posts around our campus have increased to address several issues. To add to this, over the last year, as I've said, 219 officers have left the department due to retirements and resignations. Included in this uh, figure are five officers who have lost, lost their lives. Staffing levels at the department are not where they need to be. And we have over 100 officers in training. Uh, this department is on a serious mission to recruit and retain staff. We are helping them do this. Our bill provides the necessary funding levels to help the department do this so that we can reopen safely. And all workers deserve to work in a safe and protected atmosphere. That's our number one priority. I strongly urge a no vote on this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? There's no further debate. Gentlewoman from Washington is recognized. 
I would just say that I do agree we've had a lot of challenges. We've had, as you mentioned, January 6th, we've had COVID, and they have had, they will leave lasting changes on the way we function. Um, however, before those things, we still ha were operating at a deficit with regard to Capitol Police officers, yet we managed to prioritize keeping the campus open. And I think now, my only point here is, why are we spending time and, and money on examining what meat alternatives can be served in our cafeterias on campus. It's simply an issue of prioritization. I'm, I would like to put those things on hold to demonstrate to the American public that we really are going to make uh, the reopening happen. And my understanding is that part of it is we, it, it's staffing and it's, it's bandwidth. Um, we need to redirect that bandwidth and that's what my amendment would do without I yield this adoption. Request a voice vote or a record a vote. This is Herrera but Butler number one. Is that correct? Okay. Um, a recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor, of a recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support. A recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt votes aye. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar votes no. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade votes aye. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert votes aye. Mr. Carter. Yes. Mr. Carter votes aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Mr. Case. No. Mr. Case votes no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes no. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Christ. No. Mr. Christ votes no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar votes no. Ms. DeLauro. No. Ms. DeLauro votes no. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart votes aye. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman votes aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes no. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger votes aye. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder votes no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Aye. Ms. Herrera Butler votes aye. Mrs. Hinson. Aye. Mrs. Hinson votes aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes aye. Ms. Kaptur. No. Ms. Kaptur votes no. Mr. Kilmer. No. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. No. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence votes no. Ms. Lee of California. No. Ms. Lee of California votes no. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes no. Ms. Letlow. Aye. Ms. Letlow votes aye. Ms. McCollum. No. Ms. McCollum votes no. Ms. Meng. No. Ms. Meng votes no. Mr. Molinar. Aye. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse votes aye. Mr. Palazzo. Aye. Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree votes no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes no. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Reschenthaler. Mr. Reschenthaler votes aye. Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, you're Mr. muted. Rogers. Uh, Rogers is aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. No. Ms. Roybal Allard votes no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Yeah. Mr. Ruppersberger votes no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes aye. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Ryan votes no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Trone. Trone votes no. Mr. Trone votes no. Ms. Underwood. No. Ms. Underwood votes no. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo votes aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. No. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. No. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes no. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack votes aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? The clerk will tally. Again, for a piece of information, we will finish up Ledge Branch to, today, and we will have uh, both uh, subcommittees, I believe it's SVOPS and, and uh, CJS, after votes, which will mean by the end of the day, we will have 
completed uh, 10 of the subcommittee markups, yes. finishing the two tomorrow. And we will have uh, done two of the full committee, and we will do two more tomorrow and two on Friday. So at the end of the week, we'll have done six of the full and all of the subcommittee markups. So I thank you very, very much for your patience, your diligence, and your commitment to getting the work of the committee done. The Appropriations Committee is the center of this government, and you prove that over and over and over again. So many, many thanks. And with this, at the, on this vote, the yeas are 26, the nays are 32, and the amendment is not adopted. Mr. Rara Butler. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, so we dispense Clerk with the reading? Read. Okay. No, we're going to. Um, this lose. amendment, it's amendment number two, no. is Plus going to reduce the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights by a half a million it's dollars. This is like. And the, the, the purpose behind this. Can is we have your attention, please? Thank, thank you, you, Madam Mr. Chair. Butler. I understand, um, having been a former staffer in this institution, <laughs> um, I, I remember when I came out to D.C., I remember having to earn support to get here and figure out how to pay my way uh, to work in some unpaid internships and then finally landing a job on the Hill and not getting paid a ton. Um, so I, I completely understand the desire to make more money when you get a job out of college or as you're, you're starting out a career here on the Hill. But I think it's incredibly, incredibly important um, that we recognize that we all here, staff members, exist to serve the people at home. That is our, that is our mission. And, and that's not to say that each member shouldn't be taking good care of their staff. I believe that we should. But I think that the, the push for staff to unionize in a legislative environment sets up a very um, uh, strong potential conflict of interest between the folks at home and the personal goals and desires of folks here in the Capitol. You know, we're, we're pretty regulated how our salaries get paid. Um, it is submitted. It actually, it's in the Constitution how that works. And part of that is because we need to have that built-in accountability. I have very strong concerns that if that effort moves forward, that that conflict will be, uh, could possibly inhibit or change how a member represents their constituents with regard to things like uh, right to work legislation and, and other pieces. And that's not to say that I, you know, I, I strongly support people's right uh, specifically to, to go to their employers and to change their environment, but this is an issue where I think it is not suited to move a union forward. I think it fails to address some of the main concerns of staff in addition, um, because federal law prohibits negotiation on pay and health care and retirement benefits. That's how th some of these things are, <coughs> it's a bigger task to tackle than what is being proposed. So this amendment pulls that money back to stop that process. Um, and, I, and I think that unionization of the House of Representatives is really impractical. And I think it could put, really place a barrier between our constituents and, and the people who they sent here to serve. So um, that's, what I, that's what this amendment proposes. I think unions uh, ha definitely have their place, but they're not suited to all situations. Um, and I think it doesn't make sense for Congress, uh, due to those unique office circumstances, fluctuating partisan balance, and really unavoidable turnover. People will lose their jobs based on how a vote goes. Um, and that's just the reality of this place. It's a special and unique place. It's an honor to serve here. And even if you serve here for a short time, you, as a staffer, wherever you move on in your life, you're going to take value from what you did here, and it will enhance your resume. It will enhance your ability to serve in any other capacity. So I urge members to support this uh, amendment. And with that, I yield back to the chair. Yeah. Mr. Ryan. Madam Chair, I rise in opposition to this amendment. This amendment would cut the recommended funding amount for the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights by half a million dollars. The Office of Congressional Workplace Rights initially requested seven and a half million dollars. However, with the passage of the House Resolution 1096, the office will need additional resources to support this effort. This funding would allow OCWR to hire additional staff members and to expeditiously process union organizing petitions that may uh, they may receive from offices. Cutting this funding would be detrimental to the rights of staff. As a staunch union supporter myself, I believe that ensuring the rights of staff is critical to the overall health 
of the House Workforce. I urge a no vote uh, on this amendment uh, and would encourage each of my Republican colleagues to also vote yes uh, on the underlying bill. We have workers here who don't make a lot of money. We're trying to compete with the private sector. This is one of the most expensive cities uh, in the world to live in. And I think this is an opportunity for those workers to take control of, of their own uh, financial well-being. So uh, again, I urge no vote on this amendment. Yes on the underlying bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. Is there any other members wishing to be heard on the amendment? I'll make one final comment. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Every worker just serves the right to unionize and to bargain collectively in the workplace free of intimidation. That same is true for congressional staff. I urge a no vote on this amendment. Mm -hmm. If there's no further debate, the gentlewoman is recognized uh, to close. I would just add that there is nothing that stops any member in this room from paying their staff what they're worth. We don't need um, to take away the prerogative of our constituents to agree or disagree with unionization rules, and that's essentially what we'd be doing. If you don't believe your staff are paid enough, or they are not making a competitive wage with the private sector, in your opinion, pay them more. But we don't need to take this out of the hands. I mean, we really do set up a conflict between folks at home and their political desires for us. We are their, we are their servants. We are not their bosses. Mm -hmm. And this amendment would keep that positional relationship in place. With that, I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Washington. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The amendment is not adopted. I believe there's one more amendment. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is that the last one? Yeah. Oh, I'm so, I, I apologize if there was one more. Okay. Okay, Ms. Kaptur, you're on. <laughs> All right, Madam Chair. <laughs> or motion. I move to favorably report the Legislative <laughs> Branch Appropriations Act 2023 to the House. Okay, a recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor recorded. No. no. Okay. No. Okay. All those in favor of the, of the motion. Say. Aye. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. No. Uh, recorded vote. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor. Sufficient number being in support. A recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt votes no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar votes aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Amade votes no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos votes aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert votes no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter votes no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright votes aye. Mr. Case. Mr. Case votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Christ. Can we, can we have some quiet, please, so people we can hear the vote? Go ahead. Mr. Christ. Mr. Christ. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar votes aye. Ms. Deloro. No, this is fine. Aye. Ms. Deloro votes aye. Mr. Diaz Bellart. Mr. Diaz Bellart votes no. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat. Mr. Espayat votes aye. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman votes no. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel votes aye. Mr. Garcia. No. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger votes no. Mr. Harder. Aye. Mr. Harder votes aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris votes no. Ms. Herrera Butler. No. Ms. Herrera Butler There's votes no. Mrs. Here. Hinson. Mrs. Hinson votes no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce votes no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor votes aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. We're trying to tally a vote. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick votes aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence votes aye. Ms. Lee of California. Ms. Lee of California votes aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada. Aye. Mrs. Lee of Nevada votes aye. Ms. Letlow. Ms. Letlow votes no. Ms. McCullum. McCullum votes aye. Ms. McCullum votes aye. Ms. Meng. Aye. 
Ms. Meng votes aye. Mr. Molinar? No. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Newhouse? No. Mr. Newhouse votes no. Mr. Palazzo? No. Mr. Palazzo votes no. Ms. Pingree? Aye. Ms. Pingree votes aye. Mr. Pocan? Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan votes aye. Mr. Price? Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Reschenthaler? No. Mr. Reschenthaler votes no. Mr. Rogers? No. Mr. Rogers votes no. Ms. Roybal Allard? Ms. Roybal Allard votes aye. Mr. Ruppersberger? Yes. Mr. Ruppersberger votes aye. Mr. Rutherford? Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford votes no. Mr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Ryan votes aye. Mr. Simpson? Mr. Simpson votes no. Mr. Stewart? Mr. Stewart votes no. Mrs. Torres? Mrs. Torres votes aye. Mr. Trone? Mr. Trone. Mr. Trone votes aye. Ms. Underwood? Ms. Underwood votes aye. Mr. Valadeo? Mr. Valadeo votes no. Mrs. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz votes aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman votes aye. Ms. Wexton. Ms. Wexton votes aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack. Ms. Mr. Womack votes no. Yeah, let me know. Mr. Christ. Mr. Christ. Mr. Christ, did you cast your vote? Aye. Mr. Christ votes aye. Thank you. She's, she, she's got a tally. Yo, baby. Nice job. Yeah, good job. Keep it rolling. The only question is if we should keep PJ at seven. Then how about I say we will complete markups in the same way? We have to pick. Do we want to move both of them or do we want to move after? PJ was going to get seven. On this vote, the yeas are 32 and the nays are 26, and the motion is agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and con conforming changes to the bill and report just approved. Seeing no objection, so ordered. I'm assuming the you know, three days without objection. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Oh. Committee is adjourned.